territory coming at you with jonesy and kratz ron here and i think we're gonna make some history hey for the first time in this show's history which has been five minutes um we're going to have what six boxes on the screen so that we can show the sandlot crew we've got three actors from the sandlot ever heard of it ever seen it some haven't but most have um, that are going to join us coming up in just a moment, Kratzy. So we'll have them, well, in about an hour. We'll talk to Doug McCain of Dodger Nation in 15 minutes and Eloy Jimenez at 2.35 Eastern time for everyone on YouTube. And hey to everyone watching us on Stadium. Get the app. It's free 99 as in it's free or go to watchstadium.com and also participate in our polls. But you, you ready for six boxes? You ready to be a Brady Bunch member, Kratzy? I'm ready. I, I don't I don't mind like being put in a box. That is totally <laughs> fine. My entire career I was put in a box. I was so t- cast as a certain player. Today, I'll be in a box. <laughs> it feels lonely too without you here. I'm just saying it yeah. feels like my basement is super huge now. Before it felt like and it smelled so delicious. Jonesy. <laughs> Scotty Braun smells like a Cuban coming up to the plate. Like <laughs> Delicious. Like my whole basement still smells like his cologne and his essence. So no good, play good. Play yeah. good, look good, play good, smell good. There, yeah. There's two reasons for that, okay? Number one, I shower not one, but two times per day. Number two, uh, I spent a lot of time with Cliff Floyd. And He's Cliff Floyd too. likes to um, use cologne as Purell. Or, you know, it's it's used every five seconds. <laughs> it's just like a ch 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 Spending a lot of time sharing an office with him. So, you know, 10 sprays for him is like one spray for most. So for me, I was like, oh, three sprays. That's that's fine, right? Three, four sprays of cologne. Apparently that's a lot, right? That's fair. I haven't worn cologne in a lot in in a lot of minutes. How many sprays? How many sprays, Jonesy, do you do? Uh, I probably do one. And then maybe I I like like to do two. I like to do the uh, the The wrist wrist? forearm. Yeah. Do you right. go like this? Do you go like this then? No, I like to do the wrist for him and then um, just this, and then I guess just rub it on my hands a little bit. I don't know. I just... Scotty was here. He knows I don't I don't use any cologne. I barely use deodorant. One in the air, one on the neck, <laughs> one here. You got at least three, a little bit of that. So okay. um, one other thing before we start, and this is going to kickstart, charge the mound for us, maybe the home run celebration of the year, and we'll get into it. I want to ask Aloy Jimenez later. Jonah Heim. A little bit of this. Oh, I loved it. As he was going around second base to the to the bullpen, instead of this thing to the bullpen or this, whatever they do, he just went around. He went around first between first and second. He was right here. Check the replay. Uh, we have a problem. Let's charge the mound because for a second consecutive night, the entire planet is confused about the Giants and the Padres play at the plate. Now it was Texas and. Chicago the day before, but we had another replay review overturned, and we only have one catcher today instead of two. So, Eric Kratz, take it away. I just can't. I can't. I, I'm sitting there. I'm definitely. It had to be a play where you're sitting there going, "Oh, play at the plate. Yeah, yeah. Just, just review it. Go, go check. The guy's still in New York. It's the same crew. You know he's gonna call this." And didn't he call it? Didn't he call it? Like, to me, I rewatched it, and I'm sitting there going, what is Gary supposed to do? Like, are we going to start seeing guys? Because then we saw Will Smith in the Dodgers game, Dodgers-Angels game, did an awesome job. You know, it was was a swipe tag situation, but the ball was perfectly thrown. He just had a swipe tag. The guy's sliding in head first. Like, what is he supposed – what is Gary supposed to do? Is he supposed to, like – kind of lean back and catch it so he stays out of the way and then try to get him? No, I I don't I don't get it. I, I don't understand, but it's clearly the same umpire or the same crew of umpires that are like, this is how we see the rule 100%. And I hope there's a memo getting sent out. Like, did you get the memo kind of moment here for the umpires? Like, 
This is not what we're looking for. I don't, I don't feel like it's right, but hey, let's let's get some explanation. John, the, get, what, the catcher, the catcher, on? it's the, the catcher even say <laughs> it's from the catcher's point of view. I mean, he's out by a mile, and again, as a base runner, if you're pulling up, you're out. There's no replay. If you pull it up, if you slow down the slide, if you, you just know that you're out and you just put a slide in because you know you're out and just take the tag, uh, come on. The play is the play. It doesn't really need a review. But, again, the rules are the rules. But things need to things need to be adjusted in that because you're out. You can't. You cannot. He's out by 20 feet. That's an absolute cannon. Great throw. You, you can't penalize. Uh, you can't penalize the anybody in that, in my opinion. It's not a close enough play. If it was bang, bang, okay, we can review it. It's not bang, bang. I mean, again, it's discretion, and I know it's supposed to be within something, but, damn, just that, that, that and the damn, uh, the, um, the one with the, the ground rule double. If it's in the left center field ground rule double, he's scoring. But, you know, again, discretion is always weird. Yeah, but we're not, like, discretion is all on – it's in replay, like, yeah. like the, the whole, the letter of the rule is, was made so that we kept catchers safe. But in this case, it never says anything. You can't run guys over. So I think Sable said, Sable was like, yeah, it was kind of a weird play. I had nowhere to go. I don't understand why everybody wants to slide into home plate, run straight through it. If Gary Sanchez is in your way, now Gary Sanchez is a beast. That's a big dude, but you are still allowed to run him over. It is legal to run him over. I don't understand why base running, why teams, and maybe Jonesy, you can answer this. Mm-hmm. Why are they not? Why are they not just running straight through? It's it's so much faster to run straight through. I get it if you need a hook slide to get away from a tag, but run straight through. The guy gets in your way, lower a shoulder, collide with him. The ball might pop out, but if he's not in your way and you run straight through. You're going to be faster to that base, correct? Yes, but you got to slide at home plate. You just don't Why? because you do, you don't want to need a knee. We're not trying to. We, there's no collisions that you want to have at home plate ever. To be honest with you, we don't. There's, we don't even want to shin. Like only thing we ever want to do, and we hate doing it. I love doing it a little bit. Was, I was when there was say. bases bases loaded, and you know it was a comebacker, and you wipe out the uh, wipe out the catcher. I like doing that because I know the hitter is pissed. And I ain't trying to get him uh, to get into a double play, but it's Sable. I don't. I mean, Sable. Come on, you're big. You, Sable's a big boy too. Yeah. He was out. He was out by a mile. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I had nowhere else to go. You take your ass back to the dugout. You, you put the strap <laughs> on, strap the gear back on, and, and go back. Uh, go back behind the dish. You're a big boy. You want to take more punishment? You want to slide again? You go about the block, take a foul ball off the neck, the throat. All right, enjoy that if you really like to. Again. They do call him a tools of ignorance for a reason, right? Yeah, we just we just aren't athletic enough. If we were more athletic, we'd play center field. Exactly. If it was Yastrzemski, if it was uh, Wade, if it was uh, anybody else, you're talking about the catcher. That's like Gary Sanchez going there and complaining, like, he was in my way. Yeah. He wasn't in the way. The (laughs) thighs is in your way. That's who's in your damn way. Let's run uh, post-game sound from Bob Melvin. He was thrilled with the call. (sighs) Oh, yeah feel involved for something like that it's an awful call and it had an impact on the game from your viewpoint why shouldn't it have been called the based on the fact the runner was out by so much or oh, i think all the way around the, the the base runners way down the line towards their dugout at some point in time you have to go get him the throw took him up the line as well based on where he started I, the, it looked like they showed the replay from where when the throw was always already on the way and as a catcher you have to have some feel for that you got to also understand the impact and where the runner was. And it just, to me, was just one of the worst calls I've seen this year. Well, clearly he wasn't watching the White Sox Rangers game. (laughs) (laughs) One of the worst calls, Bob, you missed it the night before. It was worse, no? 12 12 hours later, worse? I don't know if it was worse. At least that was like a bang-bang play at the plate. Like, Like, this one was just like Jonesy said, he was dead out. It was like, you know, we just, just let him tag you. Just let him tag you. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I mean, Bob, yeah. he has smashing hair, and he held it together in that, in that interview. <laughs> the, the best part was, was watching Bruce Bochy 
Get out that dugout. You ain't getting out that dugout quick no more. And I remember I was at the WBC and I watched him uh, when I went to see France playing and he's coaching France. Like, nah. Uh, <laughs> he was just, he was on, I went into the weight room and he's just over there just like, ah, uh, doing a yoga mat with the ball. And I'm like, man, that's how you keep doing it though. He keeps active, head about that big, but he has a lot of knowledge up there. But he ain't getting out there as fast as he used to. The other thing I will say is his his former ball club, the Giants, despite all of that, um, playing really good ball. They've won 10 games yeah. in a row. Yes, the Reds still have won 11 in a row. They got the best, best streak in baseball. But San mm-hmm. Francisco, they're comeback kids late in games. They're playing magical ball. So I give them props there. And I do want to also touch on Otani against the Dodgers. And we're going to get deeper into the discussion with Dodgers Nation coming up. But this – is the ideal way to lose the best player in baseball. (laughs) The top contender, according to everyone, to steal Shohei Otani away in free agency, just swept the Angels. The Angels scored no runs. And in the second game, Otani pitched great seven innings, struck out 12, gave up a run. Dodgers hit two homers. Their bullpen, which has been bad lately, completely blanked the Angels' offense. The Angels' injury list includes Anthony Rendon, Zach Neto, Ben Joyce, Gio Urshela, Logan O'Hoppy, who got hurt. Now it's been a while back, but was a big part of the team at the beginning of the season. They are a half game back of a wild card, but these two games showed us why Shohei Otani is bye-bye, leaving soon. And Dodger fans are loving it. They're like, this is awesome. I get to watch Otani. He pitches great, but they still lose. And does this not convince you even more so to join the blue side? <laughs> I mean, he's had, I mean, they're the Mets, the Yankees who can afford them. Padres. I mean, you know, Padres, I mean, you know, add more. The Dodgers seem like the perfect choice just because of proximity. Um, he could take a helicopter to that place because it is annoying driving to Chavez Ravine every day. It is terrible. Uh, even with a, even with the police escort, it is horrible. So you might want to get a get a get a helicopter, um, but you might not want to get a helicopter in LA. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this, Jonesy. Too soon, Jonesy. Too soon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I just like really. Yeah, that hurt me. That hurt my. That hurt me saying know, that. R.I.P. Kobe, baby. But yeah. let, let me ask you this real quick, um, and then we'll we'll talk more Dodgers Nation um, with our guests. Literally, Dodgers Nation. If you're Shohei Otani, Jonesy, with with everything you know, background wise. And you go to the team that everyone thinks you're going to, and the team shuts out your current team that's never brought you to the postseason, and you shove, and your team scores no runs, and half your team's on the IL. Are you not like, well, that confirms it? Well, I mean, you the Dodgers are not just a team of uh, sluggers. They have built-in pitching staffs. The minor leagues is stacked. They call up Miller. They got guys, I'm sure, in the pipeline waiting. So that – is a great destination. Again, proximity, um, culture. He can literally stay at his same residence, maybe get some closer. Weather plays a, should play a big part in this. I mean, it, it's fantastic travel. And, you know, who wouldn't want to be on the West Coast? If you go to, as they always say, they was pitting Garrett Cole about New York and L.A. and, and Anaheim. I mean, taxes are the same. It's a lot. And so I, I think L.A. is the you know, just, I mean, you got Mookie Betts that's going to be there another, what, I think 10 years on his deal. Freddie <laughs> Freeman, another four, maybe. I think four. Um, I mean, Lux coming back. I mean, you got a really good young team, and he can just be the catalyst there for a strong five, six years. And that's, I don't know if I, I, I just need to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> and their prospects are better on top I'm of sure. everything else. As so. I said, the minor leagues, it's just, Stacked. And it's the stacked. Food, the food is way better in L.A. than Anaheim. I'll tell you that right now. I, I don't think Otani's been to Disney once. So I don't think that's going to keep him there. Just saying. Let's uh, let's hit our first poll of the day as the Sandlot crew is going to join us a little bit later on. Best kids baseball movie. Kids baseball movie. Angels in the outfield. Little Big League. Rookie of the Year. Sandlot. Always popular other, if you've got suggestions, please send them to us via social or in the YouTube chat or anywhere else. And if it's your first time 
playing around with our poll on stadium, scan the QR code. It's, it's very large on your screen right now, or you can go to watchstadium.com slash foul territory, and you can get yourself involved in this poll. Again, angels in the outfield, little big league rookie of the year, Sandlot or other Doug McCain, who does an awesome job running Dodgers nation, huge following, obviously is having a lot of fun the last 10 years. Going to join us next. Today is June 22nd, and here are some notable moments from this day in baseball history. On this day in 1982, Pete Rose made history. Facing off against John Stuper of the Cardinals, Rose knocked out his 3,772nd career hit, a significant milestone that pushed him past Hank Aaron to the second spot on baseball's all-time list. But Rose wasn't finished setting records. He'd later go on to surpass Ty Cobb to become the all-time leader with 4,256 knocks, a record which stands to this day. In 1987, the gifted and tenacious Tom Seaver had to sadly abandon his comeback attempt with the Mets due to injury. With a career record of 311 wins and 205 losses, an ERA of 2.86, 3,640 strikeouts, and 61 shutouts, Seaver made a lasting impact on the game. His legacy was further cemented when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1992. On this day in 1990, the Atlanta Braves, despite being in last place, made a crucial decision that would change their fortunes. They hired Bobby Cox, who would lead the team to 14 consecutive division titles, a 1995 World Series championship, and personally received three Manager of the Year awards with Atlanta. And finally, in 1994, Mets reliever John Franco made his mark by earning his 253rd career save. This achievement broke Dave Rigetti's record for most saves by a left-handed pitcher, forever etching Franco's name in the annals of baseball history. And now, back to foul territory. conversation going because out west things are very interesting nl west has of course the division leading arizona diamondbacks which is what everyone thought was going to happen and then you have the san francisco giants and the dodgers and the padres what's going on with your padres jones we're going to bring in doug mccain from dodgers nation in a moment though i'm like sitting there i'm waiting i'm like and mets fans are doing this out in new york i'm in the new york area right now they're like oh they win one or two if it's verlander or scherzer they're like here we go we're gonna rattle off seven of eight and i feel the same way with the pods and it's just not happening lately it's runners in scoring position when you watch the game they they get guys on base it's they got guys that walk they got guys that have speed so you don't ground into as many double plays like those intangibles right there they have chances but if you just look at the the numbers with runners in scoring position, they're just they're just not there yet. But again, these are teams that can reel off ten straight real easy, like everybody else, and put themselves right in the the middle of it. That's why I said I think for both teams right now, up until the All Star break, even last week up until the All Star break, is very important because you know it, it determines what what how aggressive you are at the break. If you if you go and you know play. 750 ball, 700 ball, uh, up until the break, get off something hot. You know, you might be bigger buyers than just normal buyers. Or if you play terrible and it rides into the to the, the the deadline, you might be partial sellers. They can't sell all because they got some big ass contracts. But um, they, you know, it just depends. It, it might change the temperament. So, men in scoring position, you know, that that's what they got to uh, both improve on. And you know, I just. Wait till they get hot. They're both they're all professionals. Hey, let's bring in our first guest of the day on FT Live, Doug McCain, who hosts Dodger Nation on YouTube. And also you can follow him at DMAC underscore LA, also the co-host of Blue Heaven Podcast. So he does a lot. And you've got a very devoted Dodger audience that I want to hear the pulse of right now. Doug, great to have you on, dude. And how's your 2023 season going? It's going, it's interesting. It's not what we're used to here. Of course, you wouldn't have a great bullpen, which is something that's a foreign feeling here for Los Angeles. We're used to having a dominant bullpen, dominant pitching. It's almost like you took in and out burger away from us or something. We just don't know how to act with this bullpen that we have right now. But yeah, I mean, 
yesterday. I mean, you had back-to-back shutouts against the Angels. I mean, things definitely look like they're heading into the right direction. 14 scoreless innings for this Dodgers pen. So definitely something to feel good about moving forward. I got a real question for you. How you doing? Are the are the, going, are the are the D-backs for real in this division? Are y'all are y'all scared of them a little bit? That's a true story. Y'all scared of them a little bit? I mean, y'all been running away with this division for a damn decade. I'm a Padres fan. It hurts my soul. We kicked y'all ass last year. I was so happy. But are the D-backs <laughs> the D-backs a team this year? Look, I definitely think the D-backs are a team that they're scrappy. They're a team that has tenacity. They're a team that use the hit the get put the ball in play. They run the bases. I think pitching will the pitching. With Nelson and and Gallo, will that stand the test of time for the whole year? That's pretty my only, pretty much my only question. But I definitely think the Diamondbacks are for real. I definitely think the Diamondbacks are a team that's going to challenge the Dodgers. They're going to challenge the Padres. I took a lot of flack from Giants fans that said I was a homer because I picked the D-backs to finish ahead of the Giants this season. But obviously, the Giants they've gotten it going of late. But I definitely think this is one of the most competitive divisions in all of baseball right now. You have four teams that definitely have a chance to win it. I mean, I think the Diamondbacks they're young. They're the team of the future, but they could also be the team of the present. So is in and out really that good? Like, is that really – like, do you really love in and out as a guy that lives out there all the time? Don't don't even answer, Jonesy. I don't even need to hear your answer. Sorry. First of all, Eric, I just want to say that I also was a catcher for the Phillies, but mine was in South Pasadena in Little League, so we have that connection there. But, you know, I will say, yeah, in and out's fire, man. In and out the double-double, you can't beat it. I mean, it's in and out. I mean, I think it definitely tops Whataburger, in my opinion. You can't go wrong with in and out, man. Definitely – Definitely slaps, especially late at night. It definitely does slap. I would agree with you. I would not agree with you that the Giant, that the Giants or the Diamondbacks should give this Dodgers team that's underwhelming right now. And as yes, they beat the they beat the Angels, and everybody wants to talk about Otani, like going to the Angels. I want to talk first. Are the Dodgers good enough to get Otani? And if they are good enough. Are they, are they going to hamstring themselves when they get Otani next year? Good question, Eric. I think for you look at this Dodgers organization, you look at Shohei Otani. This is a guy that has everything calculated for himself. He wrote a list when he was 15 about how he wanted his life to pan out. He wanted to win a World Series by the age of 28. Well, last time I checked, he already is 28, has not only not won a World Series, hasn't even made it to the postseason, hasn't even had a winning season with the Angels. And definitely things are trending in the right direction. You've seen that organization under Perry Maniason there focusing on adding pitching, but still, you just haven't had the depth that you need. And with this Dodgers organization, they're consistently among the top when it comes to farm systems and when it comes to developing homegrown talent. Yes, this year, you've seen a little bit of a youth movement. Guys like James Altman had a hot start. Miguel Vargas has had his ups and downs, but he hits a home run. Last night, Bobby Miller, he looks like he's a future frontline starter. So if I'm Shohei Otani, I'm looking at this Dodgers organization, I'm saying to myself, can I win now? The answer is yes. You have some of the best players in the game, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, Will Smith. I mean, the lineup is still devastating. And I think, too, you look at the future. Can this organization not only sign talent, they have the resource, they have the deep pockets to bring in guys, they can also build their own homegrown talent. We see just the list goes on and on. Clayton Kershaw, Corey Seager, Walker Buehler, Will Smith. This team identifies and develops talent as good as any team out there in Major League Baseball. And that's what I would look at if I was Shohei Otani. And also, too, if I'm the Dodgers and I'm Shohei Otani, I'm saying, hey, if they're going to give me half a billion, if they're going to give me $600 million possibly, I need a team that's going to be able to invest, bring back, and want to win World Series titles. And I think this organization right now with the Dodgers, they're not satisfied at all. I talked to the Dodgers owner last year, Mark Walter, And I said, hey, have you realized the dream? Is this the vision realized? He's like, no, we want more World Series. We want to be greedy. We want more titles. And the reality is 10 seasons, 10 straight postseason appearances. That's the third best streak behind the Braves of the 90s and the Yankees of the 90s and early 2000s, but just one title in a 60-game season. And I know Dodger fans, they're not satisfied with that. So I almost feel like this organization has to win two to really win one to satisfy this fan base. And I definitely think you do that in a big way with Shohei Otani. So... Financially, you know, they obviously they didn't bring back Seager. Um, Kershaw, I don't, he's not, I mean, I still think he's probably gonna pitch next year. Maybe not, I mean, he's probably making the same salary. Financially, do you think they can afford him? And is it a 10 year deal? Is it, again, half a billion is probably the starting point, but is it 10? Is it 12? We see how some teams are going to 13 just because of structure. Um, do they have that? Do they have that money since they were in there were some conversations of them in judge? I don't know if there was a former formal um, offer, but it's the Dodgers. It's not anybody else. 
So the way I look at it is I say, look, yes, can they afford it? Do they have the deep pockets and the resources? 100% they do. This team consistently leads all of Major League Baseball when it comes to revenue, when it comes to attendance. They print money. And I've said to Dodger fans at the beginning of the season that always complain about increased parking and increased beer prices and increased concession prices. Every time you take a buy that $50 hot dog or that $100 beer, that $200 parking after they sign Otani, you got to feel good about it. That's the Otani tax you're giving for Otani. I don't care if they have to make the jersey patch his logo, sign a Lionel Messi type of deal. You have a chance to get a once in a generation type player. You have to go out there and do it. And also on top of that, if you look at the way this team has been structured, if you look at the offseason last year, they didn't make very many moves. And Dodger fans, they weren't happy about it. You mentioned Aaron Judge. Yeah, there was a lot of talk. Maybe they go after Aaron Judge. Maybe they go after Carlos Correa, Dansby, Swanson, Xander Bogart, some of the big name free agents. But they didn't do that. It's almost like when you ask your mom, hey, mom, can we get McDonald's? And your mom's like, no, we have food at home. The food at home was still pretty good for the Dodgers last year and this year. They still have a lot of talent, and they've given themselves the flexibility to go after a Shohei Otani and definitely make it a reality. I just think it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, there's – Ties with this organization, Otani, dating back to when he was in high school, when he was being scouted by then. And with the Dodgers, they made a pitch to Otani back in 2017. And they tried to sell him on the idea that, hey, maybe you could play outfield and you could also be a pitcher. But we know that that wasn't realistic. But now you have the universal DH. You got a big market in the Dodgers. I think the big question I have is does he want to consider an East Coast team? Does he want to possibly take a big bag from Stephen Cohen that has more money than God? Does he want to be in New York? Like I've said, I had Buster only on my show, and we were talking about this, and he thinks the Dodgers have as good of a shot as anyone. I said, hey, if he wants to be on the East Coast, let's move the Dodgers back to Brooklyn. Whatever it takes to get Shohei Otani. So you mentioned, you mentioned one thing about Shohei's kryptonite is a slider. Okay, well, his numbers on – Sliders are pretty much my career numbers. Actually, his slugging percentage is higher, so that sucks for me. But for him, do you feel like there's a chance? I can't believe I'm saying this. When he goes to the Dodgers, because you've already you know signed the contract, delivered it, six hundred and ten million. You heard it here first. Can they make Shohei Otani better with the knowledge and the information that they have? Well, Eric, it's really interesting because last night was actually the first time I'd ever seen Shohei Otani pitch in person. And the first thing that stood out to me in the bullpen just watching him warm up is the fact he's calling his own pitches. I mean, he is calling his own pitches, the sequencing. And last night, the interesting thing was, yeah, he's been throwing a lot of that sweeper. He's been throwing less splitter this season. Last night, he goes with that cutter, and he's reading pitches. And he's reading the fact that these Dodger hitters, they're not expanding the zone. They aren't chasing. And, of course, the one mistake he made to Freddie Freeman, he hits that bomb. But other than that, he's still dominating. He's still having 12 strikeouts. But, yeah, to answer your question, can he be better with the Dodgers? I think there's no question about the fact that Mark Pryor and what this pitching staff does, what this developmental staff does as far as sequencing and getting guys to be at their very best when their best is needed and just really optimize them, I definitely think they have that. But Shohei Otani, I think, for him, it's just about staying healthy, staying on the mound, and he's continued to evolve himself. Like I said, that sweeper slider is a nasty pitch. Really the only pitch that has he's had issues with as far as hard contact and missing barrels is really that cutter. And for the most part, I mean, the velocity, I mean, last night, I mean, 12 strikeouts, he's still pumping 99 miles per hour, right? And it's just incomprehensible, a guy that is an ace, a Cy Young contender, and an MVP candidate. The guy who struck out 12 batters last night against one of the most potent lineups in the league also leads the sport in home runs. It just doesn't make any sense. And I think, yes, he's playing with Mike Trout. Yes, he's had some talent with the Angels. But I don't think top to bottom on the margins as far as depth, he has seen anything like he could possibly see with the Dodgers. And that is really how you win in this league. You got to have the depth. You have to have that to have the sustained winning. And I think he would have that in L.A. I think that would make him a better player. Doug, it's spot on because the Dodgers are a top five team for the past decade plus in finding gems, right? We're not going to spend time educating on everyone that they've picked up both as, as hitters and as pitchers, but I'll just give you like a very real world recent, recent example of why Dodgers front office, Dodger fans are like <laughs> Tyler Anderson. Last year, we bring them over. We turn them around. We turn them into a number, what, three starter or so. He has a sick year. It is not happening right now with the Angels. So it ends up really hurting the Angels because they spent good money on him. This is a soft tossing lefty who had one good year. And it's no offense to Tyler. It just, it just to me, paints the picture of what the Dodgers pitching machine can do. And then a guy leaves and all of a sudden grass is not 
greener. So I agree with you. I think you can flip that. And can Otani be better? Yeah, why not? Like you said, w- between what he can learn behind the scenes, the supporting staff that he has, I think that's a prime example, right? You've seen this for years, even though I know there's a lot of complaints this year about the bullpen. How often have the Dodgers not spent on their bullpen and found guys kind of like how the Rays have done, Andrew Friedman bringing that mentality over, picking up guys off waiver claims, and all of a sudden they're like eighth inning high leverage. No, I think that's a great point. A lot of fantastic points. By the way, Scott, big fan. I just want to say, yeah, we look at Tyler Anderson. He hasn't had the same success with the Angels, and you talk about the development of this Dodgers team. And just talking a lot about, too, I talked to Emmett Sheehan, who had six score, six hitless innings for his big league debut. One of the things he told me was, this Dodgers organization, they make it as complex or simple as you want it to be. They'll give you all the data, all the analytics, but they really just want to unlock you by finding what it is that you do best and keep pounding that. And you're starting to see that. I mean, even the Justins in the bullpen last night, pounding the fastball, getting first pitch strikes. So it's sequencing, it's developing, it's all the science behind it. It's not like they have this magic lab that they all put on lab coats and they sprinkle this Dodger dust or anything like that. They just know how to identify talent and maximize it. I mean, you saw with Tyler Anderson last year, he adjusted the grip on that changeup to give him that vertical movement. He ends up having an all-star and getting himself a nice $39 million back. So if I'm a pitcher out there, I call this reliever rehab as far as relievers coming here, getting themselves back on track, going out there and signing a big deal. Of course, it hasn't worked out for Noah Syndergaard, so they're not batting 1,000 in that respect. But, yeah, as far as not going out there and spending on relievers, that's just not what Andrew Friedman does. He doesn't like to get the big prospect capital for these big relievers. That's just not his MO. I mean, for his starters, yeah, he likes to do that. You see him going out there and make a trade for a Max Scherzer and a Trey Turner, giving up your top two prospects. If it's for a position player, yeah, you'll give Mookie Betts a $365 million bag or Freddie Freeman a $162 million bag. But it's not the same for relievers. For those players, he shops at Whole Foods. He shops at Gelson's, right? He shops at those top-notch places. For relievers, it's more like the 99 cent store, right? He's not looking to do that. And also, too, as far as the trades go, I mean, he's a guy that you understand how competitive it is during the season with the expanded postseason. More teams that are making it, more teams that aren't going to want to part ways with their best guys. And I would love to see the Dodgers go out there and bolster this bullpen. But last year, who they traded for, Scott? They traded for Chris Martin. And at the time, people were blowing me up saying, Doug, this bullpen's not going to do anything. Who's Chris Martin? I thought he's the lead singer for Coldplay. I said, wait up. Look at the strikeout rate. Look at the velo. Look at some of his advanced stats. And he was lights out to end the year. I mean, with the with the Cubs, Chris Martin had an ERA over four with the Dodgers, a 146 ERA in 24 and two thirds innings. So the only issue, though, is do you part way with some of your best prospects for relievers? We know Andrew Freeman. He likes to buy the Halloween candy the day after Halloween when it's 50 percent off. Right. That's what he likes to do. So I'd like to see him go out there and get a Sam Mole or Al- Alzale or someone like a Scott Barlow, one of those big names. But I think there's a guy that you're just going to say, who is this guy? And all of a sudden he's lights out down the stretch. Hey, one name that's been lights out, <clears throat> Evan Phillips. Okay, he's been very, very good. We got him in a trade in Baltimore, I believe, in 18 when we had a fire sale. Uh, I walked in the clubhouse in New York looking like Will Smith on the last episode of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> uh, but he, <laughs> he, he, I knew he had good stuff. He threw hard, had a slider, a good slider. We were a bad team, so I really didn't get to see much of him. But five years later, he is the, the closer. Um, right now for the Dodgers, and it's just good to see the persistence of uh, of just the game. And you know, then he wasn't he was getting lit. Now he's shoving it. So I'm happy yeah. to see that. <laughs> yeah, I know Evan Phillips has been just everything you could ever hope for. I mean, he's another guy that you didn't know who he was. People are thinking out that the Dodgers are a bargain basement hunting they got him off the dollar menu but no he turns out to be one of the best relievers in the league and anytime you see someone from tampa bay too you got to really pay a close attention to it you got to keep a close eye on that and he's been one of the best relievers in the sport at 212 era this season a strikeout rate at 32.7 percent since you put on that dodger uniform and added that cutter and started to throw that sweeper this season he's getting soft contact he's breaking bats and I really can't wait to see kind of one of the big developments in Dodgerland as far as fixing this bullpen is the return of Daniel Hudson. And Daniel Hudson is a guy who, of course, is a guy, of course, he gets the final out of a World Series, so you know his pedigree there. But back-to-back games for OKC, the Dodgers AAA affiliate, had a 1-2-3 inning last night on 15 pitches. He's on track to do- to join the Dodgers next week when they hit the road against Colorado and Kansas City. So to get him back 
and fortify this bullpen, give them some stability, that's going to go a long way because then you take Evan Phillips, and we call him Fireman Phillips out here in L.A. You can throw him into any high leverage situation, top of the lineup, meat of the lineup, big situation, you can get big outs. I want to ask, as somebody who's big on social media, how important was this conversation that was recently had between two conglomerates within themselves, Mookie Betts and Mike Trout? How important was this for baseball as, you know, Team USA, center fielder, right fielder, co-captain, pseudo-captain? Uh, how important was this for, just for the game of baseball? Man, I think it's great for the game of baseball. I'm not going to lie. I told Mookie yesterday, I was like, man, that I was like, you need me to tell you, Mookie, but that podcast is fire. I also told him that Jordan Brand needs to give him a signature shoe like Derek Jeter had. But Uh-oh. Did we we got freeze. Him. We freezed him. We got to freeze. That was a tough question, Jonesy. A good one. He'll refresh no. it. He'll refresh <laughs> it. I want to know who he thinks is better. Who does who does he want? Ooh, who I does he want for the next for the next seven years? The That's man on the is. right or the man on the left? Ooh. So we'll wait for him to refresh that link. And who do you want? That should be that should be a poll. Let's create a poll. If everybody's watching, who would you want for the next yeah. eight years? Or 10, eight years, who would you want in your franchise for the next eight years? That, that's, I mean, I think they're both under contract. Mookie has 10 maybe, and I don't know the status of it. Yeah, they're, they're there for life until they're senior. Who, would you, who yeah. would you want for the next decade? That's the, that's, the, that's the question. I mean, I don't feel like you're making a bad choice, but Mookie just is so athletic and can do so many things, and he's not – this is crazy that I'm saying it, He's not as big as Trout. I feel like bigger oh, no. dudes. I feel like bigger dudes sometimes wear out quicker when there's, you know, when there's athleticism involved. But that, you hear what I call Trout at the All Star game in 2015. I walked. I like. I got to like see him, and I'm like, bro, you the white Bo Jackson. <laughs> he really is. I played with him when he was 19. I played with Trout when he was 19, and he looked like he was to the point where I was like, if he was. Like, you know, some Dominicans are like, ah, I don't know what kind of age he is. I thought, I was like, if you were Dominican, you could be like 23 years old. And he was 19. Yeah. And we, uh, we thank Doug for joining us. We'll put his socials up. He'll bring, he'll come back at some point this season. Of course, we'll come back with take it or leave it. The Reds can't lose. I, as a manager, I'm not going to get any hits to win a game. I'm not going to throw any strikes. All I know is when a player started getting in it out there, my job was to defend the players and get them out of there so that they would stay in the game. So I would always, and I did it very well, turn the umpire's ire on me, and they'd forget all about the player, and that's kind of what I wanted. So I had coaches that could run the game, and if they wanted something, they needed something, they'd come up and ask me, what do you want to do? But I had a great coaching staff. I trusted them. So getting thrown out, there's a lot of times I got thrown out that I'm like, I should be in the clubhouse because I suck right now. So go run it. So there you have it. <laughs> Do you have any specific run-ins that you remember that were like super memorable, whether it's, you know, with a, a certain ump that you had a fun relationship with or a heated relationship with just because you guys had a lot of back and forth? I had, you know what, I, I had some umpires that we got after it, you know, Hunter Winnelstadt and I, early in my career, we, we argued a bunch and he threw me out a bunch, but we talked it over more than once. You know what? At one point he came, God bless his soul. He came walking in the dugout. I think it was in Minnesota and he had a picture of him throwing me out of a game and he took it out of his umpire shirt and showed it to me in the dugout with my team as he was walking out the umpire. Now, that one killed me. I absolutely thought that was the best. I got pitched in the first inning a few times. <laughs> I mean, all related from the day before, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes you get in those situations, all you want to do is talk to them. And they kind of like blow you off with the hands. Nothing makes you madder than that because then you got to spend it. You're thinking about it all night long. Then you get to the park and it's a day game and you go out to home plate. And next thing you know, you start in again and you get thrown out again.
As we're showing poll results for our first question today, best kids baseball movie, we need answers. Jonesy, your answer? Sandlot. Mm -hmm. That's biased. We have Sandlot uh, <laughs> joining us later. Yes, Sandlot, the actors. Uh, I agree, though. Sandlot was, was the OG for me. Yeah. Kratzy? Yeah, Sandlot, for sure. 100%. I mean, I, I, the other ones were good. Rookie of the year, everybody wanted their arm to break and then go, <laughs> be able to throw 114 or however, however hard he threw it. I think, I mean, I, but it's good too. Like, Sandlot is just the perfect childhood, what we all did. The, the 90s, though, 80s and 90s, the real 90s, when our parents didn't know what we was doing, we going out and we all hanging out at the park. Now these kids, they link through video games and social media and iPads. We linked up at the park. Everybody knew where we was at. Like, that was our childhood. And then you got Major League because we all played. We played in the Major League. So, you know, you played in the minors and then you play in the majors. You're like, that, that's it right there. Everything about it, especially if you play for a sorry-ass team, you figure out, like, that, that's, that's perfect. Sandlot's consistently been winning. There were writing candidates. I'll just throw one out there, Bad News Bears. But I'm like, is that, is that suitable for kids, too? Mm -hmm. I showed it to my I showed it to my middle school team like the new version and I was like, Ugh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. This is a little bit more crude. No, not not suitable for kids. <laughs> okay, fair. And uh, the second poll of the day question: If you were a player at the trade deadline, where do you want to go? If you're in the major leagues, Dodgers, Braves, Rays, Reds, Rangers other let us know again you can scan that qr code to get involved or watch stadium.com slash foul territory help us out and we'll uh, show you results coming up later i'll vote during the next break let's play take it or leave it for the first time on stadium as ft live continues also on youtube the cincinnati reds will be in the nlcs this year take it or leave it kratzy no nlcs NLCS is a little bit too far for them. They need to get some... Hey, you know what? They are really hot right now. They're not going to win 11 games in a row all the time. But you got to... There's a reason they have, I think, 23 come from behind wins. It's because their starting pitching gets them up down in the game. So playoffs, all of a sudden, come from behind wins are way, way tougher to get because you're facing... The number one, the number two, the number three relievers in team in playoff teams, the bullpens. So NLCS, no. But I see them making the playoffs, and I don't feel like anybody's gonna really argue that. Jones? Yeah, I gotta say no to the NLCS also. Um, I just think that well, first off, it's a great story what they're doing. Eleven straight is magnificent, let's be honest. Let's just give them their flowers. To maintain that throughout the season, it's going to be tough. There's young, a lot of young guys right now. They're playing with energy. That's fine and dandy. Adjustments will be made, and then you might see them go eight down, and you'd be like, okay. Uh, like you've seen the Pirates come down to earth real quick. But I just think that, no, I think that some of this energy can maintain throughout the next, you know, throughout the rest of the season because they got young guys with a lot on the line, They're just with opportunity. Same with Pittsburgh. You got opportunity here. So, it can stay, and they could be pseudo small buyers uh, at at the at the break. But to say that they're going to NLCS, that's 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 a bit far. But to say that they can't compete for a wild card spot is not out of the realm because I think they can uh, you know maintain some of this grind through uh, through the rest of the season because no. that that division is not the greatest, and they're going to beat up on each other. No, not not wild card division division. Yeah, yeah, they need division. division. They need, they the need division. a division. You true. That's true. That that division needs division. Yeah, uh, at the, that division oh. still got the Cardinals nine games back. Cubs have won eight of nine. Just want to shout them yeah. out. The Pirates are next. Let, take it or leave it. Not because they've lost nine games in a row and have fallen to fourth place, and I've been calling it all year, but because their city connects have been released. There we go. Kutch looks good in anything, so that doesn't count. Can we show someone else wearing the uniforms? Thank you. Uh, the City Connects are underwhelming. Take it or leave it. Jonesy? Uh, I mean, City Connects, one thing about City Connects is that I believe they all grow on the city as they connect to the player and the city. <laughs> uh, those are, I mean, they look like Heinz mustard. 
Um, <laughs> it looked like, yeah, it looked like. <laughs> 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 I mean, I say, hey, imagine my head is my high school. It, 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 that is, I mean, it, eh. if you're going for the Steelers, look, you got it. Um, but think about it is that it's going to grow on, on it's going to grow on people. And again, you're right. Kush looks great and everything. Um, but it's going to grow on them. Like uh, I got the Baltimore one and when I first seen it. I was like, man, that looks like something you sell like the, the, the cheap malls at, in the city, the hood malls when you don't really go to. Um, but I got one and it really, really grew on me as I seen it. And I was like, well, damn, this is actually pretty thoughtful in what they did. So it's going to grow in the city of Pittsburgh in the city of Pittsburgh only. Jonesy, don't do that. Don't bring, don't bring the, <laughs> don't bring the Pirates' mediocre, mediocre City Connect jersey to your broke Baltimore Orioles jersey Come because they on. sent you one in a box all yes. the way over that box. Come on, that box is better than that jersey. Don't. And you got your haircut, and you got your haircut just for this video. Like, yes, I did. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this to your fans. They want you to be real. That is a broke City Connect jersey. That is, um, they could have done so much more, just like Pittsburgh could have done so much more. I think Pittsburgh's is kind of meh because I do actually like the yellow mustard color that they brought out there, but they weren't allowed to use, they weren't allowed to use 412. They weren't allowed to use uh, Three Rivers. They weren't allowed to use like so many different things. I just think, eh, I just think leave it. I'm just... I'm just kind of a, a leave it on that one. Yeah, and I, I think Jonesy went to go get the uniform to back up the claims that it's, it's legit. Meant. It looks better in person, but these things need to look good for a national television audience. And they're like these little details like, oh, look, we put one polka dot on the inside <laughs> stitch of the left sleeve. No one can see that. Okay, Jonesy, show us as we go to break, and we'll talk more about it later. Boom, for the rest of the show. We'll come back with our picks next. In case you missed it, here's some scenes from around Major League Baseball from yesterday. And now, back to foul territory. We're back on Stadium and on YouTube. Scotty Braun, Adam Jones, and Eric Kratz. So let's put a close to this second poll. Uh, if you're a player 
which team do you want to join this year at the trade deadline? Like, let's assume you're on a shitty team, right? You're hanging around, you're on Detroit, or you're trying to escape Oakland. Um, where do you want to go? Right now, it looks like the Dodgers are the clear favorite. Texas getting a lot of love, too. Jonesy, if you were in that spot, where would you want to go? Ooh, it's it's it, it's hard not to say Texas, you know, uh, especially if you're a guy who is, um, you know, making a lot of money and it's, you know, get them taxes uh, for two months in taxes. True. Nice. No, but no, Texas has a, has a really, really, really good team. And, you know, if they hold on, I mean, they'll be, I, I think now they're either, well, now you can't, they got to win the division too. The whole East is taking everything. So, as of now, they're they're a playoff team, and that'd be a that'd be a very good place to play. It's indoor. It's a great hitters park. Um, there's not much pressure. Yeah, Kratzy, he sold me on the on the state income tax too. I forgot about that. You get a little bonus for joining. That's Texas. the first thing we think about, brother. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> that's I that's about it. that's rich that's rich people problems. <laughs> I'm in I'm right now in AAA thinking, okay, which team needs a catcher? Which team <laughs> needs me to come? I would go to the Reds. I love their I love their youthful energy and you know the tax is negligible for the three hundred thousand dollars I'll make for the last half of the season. But I would take it. I would take it. But the Reds, if I have more years, if like if I'm like a 30 year old, if I'm like a 30 year old player, I wouldn't go to the Reds because it's like, ooh, I could stick on this team for another three, four years. These boys are banging too. And it's a small park, dingers galore. Yeah, it's a vibe there. I'm with you. All right, let's run through locks to finish up our first hour on Stadium. And then a reminder, Aloy Jimenez and part of the cast of Sandlot joining us in hour number two. So we backtrack our Wednesday locks presented by BetMGM. Lucy, our special guest every other week, nailed it. Uh, AJ over five and a half Ks for Whitlock, nailed it. I lost. Seattle lost to the Yanks. Seattle sucks right now. Kratzy, yours doesn't count. You can't pick rainouts. Yeah, but the void looks so terrible. I hate seeing the the red, and I tried to add it in later. I had a rain out. I knew the rain out was coming, possibly. So I tried to switch it. I won that one with Whitlock, and I got four from whoever went. Oh, Gray, Sunny Gray, but didn't count. Void. Void. You got to look at the weather report. But yep. Jonesy, I hear you, you've got something special. Like you're, you're a witch today. You're like putting all these different things into a pot and going. Which is blue. Plus five hundo with your lock. What do you got? Plus five hundo today. I'm I'm uh, I'm exploring my new uh, betting philosophy. And <laughs> I'm going to go with, I'm going to take McClellan tonight. If I said his name wrong, you all yep. know how to say it correctly. I'm taking him plus seven and a half K tonight against the Ray or against the Royals. He has not had, as Scratchy told me, has not had um, like seven plus Ks in nine starts. He's gonna get it tonight. And I'm taking my man Randy Macho Man Rosarena at plus as uh, over. Uh, he needs a hit in RBI. Okay. And, and that's at plus five hundred. Yeah. He'll hit all of that. You don't think that they can get that? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's roll. RBI. It's Let's not go. crazy. Come on, five man. to one Come odds. On, Come on, five to I got one some odds. on the Royals. Hey, y- y'all ain't got to. Y'all can still win. I didn't say nothing about the win. See, I went. I didn't go that route today. No, the, I, I'm actually more concerned about the K's than the hit in the RBI, yeah. Kratzy, just because the Royals make some contact. But I like it. I like it. I'll tell that. What do you got, Kratzy? Yeah, I'm telling that too. I got Herman versus Wu at the Stadium in the Bronx. We're going five plus strikeouts for both boys. Wu had nine, I think, last time out. The Yankees are punching out. The Mariners always punch out. Herman needs to step it back up after a little bit of a shakiness, but he's going to get his five, maybe even seven. I thought about buying it up, but we're at a minus 110. So I'm going to put 330 down to win myself another 300 since last night's didn't count. Fair, fair. Get yourself back in uh, in gear. And then I'll go uh, Padres Giants over eight runs at minus 120. Padres offense, in my mind, could cover that alone. I, they, it's usually like you don't see much from them, and then they explode. They're still hitting the baseball, and Jonesy said earlier, they're just not capitalizing with runners in scoring position. Hitting lefties really well this month, I'll take that. And for me, Snell, he's been so good, but he's not as good on the road. Giants are hitting the baseball well. They take walks, and Snell still has severe walk issues. So I could see them getting a couple, both bullpens a little bit tired. So I'll go over eight runs in that one. And for you BetMGM fam, uh, Spicy Ball is the code to use. There's our picks, by the way. Um, Over eight, 
Jonesy's going nuts today. Tell him. Yeah. Um, Spicy Ball is the code. Sign up and deposit into your newly created account. Download the BetMGM Sports app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Place your first bet offer and receive up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if it loses. And if that does happen, your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled. Always bet responsibly. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And we're finishing up our first hour here on Stadium. Hour number two, we are talking to some of the cast from Sandlot. And also, first appearance of the year for Aloy Jimenez on FT Live. And AJ Pierzynski is sitting somewhere sobbing because he is missing a White Sox conversation for the first time probably this year. Bringing on a White Sox player without AJ. It's okay, AJ. Lance was on Lance was on the other day for the first oh, time with Todd, true. who's also a Lance Lynn teammate. Lance has been with a lot of people. Todd's been with a lot of teammates. But, yeah, AJ not being able to see his boy Eloy. He definitely – who's been swinging a hot bat? Like, let's, let's, not, let's not forget about that. And also, um, Jonesy, AJ is on a one game, as in Przinsky, is on a one day suspension because he had not seen Sandlot yet. We're like, sorry, no, dude. He didn't like it. I think no, he, he didn't saw see it. it. No, no, didn't see it. Uh, I got to confirm that. I got to confirm that. I thought he said he was like, eh, didn't like it. He's like, Bull Durham. Well, it's not even on the same realm, it's not the same. I, I'm pretty sure I have confirmation, and I basically live in his home, that he has not seen the movie. Oh so you gosh. can't interview the cast and be like, hey, guys, remember, remember that time uh, that guy, the, yeah. the Homer? Remember, remember, that, remember that movie? There was baseball and stuff? Like, AJ would just be <laughs> – he'd be out. So we need to make sure we, we mention it to the boys, too. He, he said his kids have seen it, but, but he has not. AJ terrible. has not seen it, so terrible. terrible. Uh, thanks to the crew watching us on Stadium. Um, you can continue this with us on the Foul Territory YouTube channel. Hit a subscribe and watch us continue this thing live for another hour of Foul Territory. We are here, and first off, we didn't give it enough time. So, Jonesy, run us through a tour of the Baltimore City Connect. I will say the number one thing I love, obviously, is the color burst. What is that on the on the sleeves? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, they have a whole card and everything about it, but I just got to – I'm attention to detail type of guy, and mm -hmm. just the splatter here on the Baltimore. I mean, it's block letters. I guess, you know, won't be firm – uh, firm name, but it gets colorful. And, you know, if you go to Baltimore, Baltimore is a very artistic city and a very colorful city, very, very good food. So, I just, you know, I just think that they just want to be colorful. Obviously, it's very strong and bold with the, you know, the black and the bold letters, but I just think everywhere else it's colorful and wanted to show that, you know, Baltimore is more than just what you see on the news. It's a, it's a place of culture, a place of history, in a place of food, you know, I'm a fatty. So uh, I'm, I'm glad they got me one. There's only a one of one of these, by the way, with Jones on it. Since I'm not a current player, it'd be foul for them to sell it. I hope they sell it so I can get some licensing. But, uh, yeah, this is a one of one. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty happy that, uh, they, that they sent me it. It's pretty cool. Is, is that distressed font on the Baltimore is that like a, a little bit of, you know, with distressed font? Like it's like foul territory. You see how we got like the. Yeah. Yeah, the, the splatter. splatter. Yeah, what's Do, the they splatter? Have that? What's the splatter Do I see about? some splatter on Baltimore? Um, I don't, I don't want to get into that. Uh, maybe okay. it's maybe it's like the living color. I'm gonna go with that. It's the living. No, color. I like that. It's I'm saying I like color. it. My okay. point was gonna be Jonesy that I want to see if if you're distressed, I want to see a little bit more of it. That's my thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like like really emphasize it because on on TV, you know, you're up close here on a show right now, but on TV, when I see the city connects, like I can't see that. So it just looks like a basic white Baltimore cross. Yeah, like, they, I, I really they, like the know. distress. Clearly. I mean, we picked out foul territory. Right. I mean, they really could have added more. Um, I mean, splatter in Baltimore. Sometimes I mean, I'm, I'm too soon today. I, mean, I don't know. What's yeah. Too, but, too soon. Jonesy. But, but it is this, I mean, I, I, I love it. They could have added, it could even been more colorful here if they wanted to. But I love it when uh, Mateo he wears his he wears his sleeves like this. I, I really like the colorfulness of it. And if you've been around the city, they have a, really, a lot of colorful buildings, so they did a good job. When you, it's it's like it's the one that grows on you. This is better than Pittsburgh. Okay, I'm not sitting there looking no. like a, a big bottle of mustard. 
But uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is this is pretty nice, and as you see it more and more, um, it grows on you a little bit. Jonesy, and, you, and it says you can't clip his wings. Feel me? Jonesy. Yeah, I like that, but we can't see like the the thing yeah, that I like about that. it is uh, is all of the detail. If you're wearing it, or if I'm chilling with you in person, or if you're on the show and you're up close. My problem, this isn't just a Baltimore thing. My problem with about half the City Connect unis is you need to show them off to the world. Most people are watching on TV. I need to see things very clearly. Like they'll be like, oh, look at the, I, I was, I think you had stepped up and I was like, oh, look at this one polka dot on the back corner of, of my right sleeve, whatever. I'm like, cool. It's like, you know, people that get the, the custom um, stitching and like their, their suits and all that. And they're like, yo, look at this. Like, that's cool. But that's just like for your friends and fam, no one else can see that. That's my one thing is like, give me more flash on all these city or most of these city connects, like right in front where everyone can see it. Big time. I thought that it should have said charm city. I mean, it's, that's the nickname. That's the moniker. I mean, Philly, I don't know what they're going to do. Maybe it's the city of brotherly love. Ain't that much brotherly love in that city if you've been there. Come angry. on, kid. Hey, I'm saying, y'all some angry bastards up there, man. I love you guys, but some going <laughs> on up there, Philly. Y'all some angry, some SOBs. Just some angry, just angry, okay? How's but, the, how's the, the how's bro, what's brotherly love, though? Brotherly love is not like, man, you almost <laughs> always <laughs> fighting. That, that's true. That's yeah. why, that, that means, that's why it's, with their city connects, it needs to have that. When I seen the Padre City Connects, I was like, man, that's that's the San Diego Machados right there with the with the color scheme. It's um, Miami. Exactly. And I'm like, San Diego, Mexican culture. Uh red, green, and white. Like, I think more needs like get into the city. And like I said, Charm City would have been easy, especially in cursive. If you go around Baltimore, that's how they have it. That's how they have it on on the uh, benches all throughout the city. It says, Welcome to Charm City in that specific cursive. Like those are small details that that you can do. Again, I, I love this, but I'm saying when you talk about City Connects, there's always more and more you can do. But again, it's always who's asking those questions about, you know, who's the designers. We never really know until they're fully finished. But you got to go to some of the players. You got to go to some of the, the restaurants here, some of the long city, some some of the student, the, I mean, not student council, but city council. Just older people that just know like the history and intricacies of said city to where they can add a patch of something that only people in Baltimore, Philly, would know. I mean, I would put a cheesesteak right on the side, <laughs> straight up there in Philly. You know what I mean? And a crab cake in Baltimore or a crab in some sort. They have, you know what I mean? Because that is something that it symbolizes that city connect to everybody because that's what these cities are known for. The only way that jersey works is if you got a pack of Marlboro Reds and you roll that jersey up and it's just stuck in there. Like, come on, Baltimore. Like, you got, it's such an awesome city. And they just, they just dropped the ball, man. It was like, it was like the, you know, the, the high school, the high school student who was like, oh, crap, I forgot to make the Connect jersey uh, real quick. I, for, I mean, I don't know. Like, I got to get something. Like, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Yeah, like we'll hide all the colors and stuff. Like, anyway, it's no, no more, no more bashing on the Connect jersey. I guess I'm not gonna crack Orioles Connect jersey. No, my thing is, I mean, state flag. We talked about this. Gotta, gotta show some, some color splash there. And I like the multicolor splash, but you can't see it much. I'm like, give me that right, right in front. Maybe mix it into the whole jersey. Maybe even like some. Some polka dots with the color splash, the cursive, the charm city. We could bang this out in an hour. We could sit down. We could take an hour. We, we get one of our graphic artists. We have some great ones behind the scenes at Foul Territory, and we create some cool shit. So we yeah, have a Foul Territory. Do you feel shit. swaggy? Do you feel swaggy wearing it? Yes or no? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I feel, I feel fast. No. I, feel, I, I feel slim. Okay, but that's a jersey. But if you no, feel, feel swaggy when you put a jersey I on – I it's do good. because I would have I would have had some cleats that match this. Okay. So Ooh, I would have had this. Yeah. I would of course. So I would have been one of the only players who would have had you know on the team that had cleats that match it. So like look at Machado. Look at look at the big big time guys. They cleat. They have cleats that match those City Connects, and that goes good when it's supposed to when you just wear City Connect and you just have to wear whatever cleat is available. So I would have. I mean, I had splatter in a lot of my cleats anyway. So I could have. I would have done that, and obviously I would have made this. A big focal point and yeah. like put that the blue trim, right there. The, the that blue right there would have been hot. All of this. I would have put the trimming around. You see the pipes. 
I would have put the trimming around there, and you know, I would have made I would have made this this the cleats epic. Yep. Hey, let's go in the weeds right now as we're minutes away from being joined by the cast of Sandlot. So things that we didn't get to from earlier. I've got a lot, actually. We might have to do like a double in the weeds and bring it back. And I love the graphic anyway. Claudia nailed it. So we'll probably show it twice. But um, on the topic of merch, the Oakland A's shirt that was heard around the world that just had a very simple sell on it. That was part of a fundraiser. They bought them. They handed them out to everyone that was entering the ballpark. It was a fan-oriented promo. It was awesome. I'll give a lot of credit here to the Hall of Fame. They've got some independence. They've got a shirt that is making its way to Cooperstown as a baseball artifact for the reverse boycott. And I love that. That's super cool. That, that is a part of history. To me, Kratzy, that's what the Hall of Fame is all about. You walk through it. You're in Cooperstown. Kids like, hey, what's that cell shirt? And you're like, let me tell you a little story about a man named John Fisher, who is the ultimate villain in all of sports. That's what this shit's for. I love that. For sure. And that's what the whole Hall of Fame is about. I love, you know, what he said. The I shoot, John is the executive, the Hall of Famer. <laughs> you want me to go ex- there? I am not the saying Hall of that Fame last exec, name. John Shestakovsky. Shestakovsky, yes, he also he also wrote a ballot on his piano. Shestakovsky, <laughs> uh, you know, he just said he said we document history, and there's so much history in baseball. And this is not not that anything's happened because of this reverse boycott, but it's history. Like to say the last large crowd to ever be in Oakland, possibly if they play in a AAA stadium next year, like. This is part of history, and I think it's I think it's awesome that that they're selling those. Let's see if we can find a shirt, wear a sell shirt on foul territory here before the season's over. Oh my gosh, I would love to get one if they sell them anywhere. I want the authentics though. Medium. It's got to be medium or small. Medium. Okay, it's always medium. I would wear that shirt. I'd wear that before a City Connect Baltimore jersey. Oh. Oh man. Now, too now soon. you're just rubbing it in. Too soon, my bad, Jones. Bad. My bad. All right, let's let, let's have some fun here. So Eloy Menes is going to join us about 30 minutes. We are ready for our next guest on FT Live. Plural though, guests. Three of them joining us. It is the Brady Bunch. No, there it is. We've never done this before. The uh, three members of the cast of Sandlot joining us right now. We have Grant Gelt, Victor Demadia, and you got to let me know if I mess that up. And you guys are not making it easy for me. Shane Obedzinski. How did I do, guys? I think you did pretty It was actually really good, yeah. Yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect. Well, oh, great fun. to have all of you on. I don't know who wants to kickstart things, but we really appreciate having you guys on here. Um, let us know what you guys are up to this summer. I want to start there with why the band is all coming back together 30 years later. Thanks for having oh. us, of course. But, yeah, we're super busy this summer. We're everywhere. Um I mean, we're Louisville and next weekend, and that's like the, the biggest thing happening in Louisville, maybe ever. Uh, Grant, Grant, tell them about it. <laughs> well, you know, the uh, this year, uh, the Sandlot turned 30, which is crazy, I think, for all of us to, to hear and know. Um, but over the last few years, uh, Victor, Shane, and myself have been working on putting together a 501c3 uh, called Oh, Uh-oh. we may have lost Grant, but he was saying we put together a 501c3. <laughs> uh, it's a nonprofit called Play Forever. Uh, it's, it's my shirt here. And, and we're putting on a, uh, <clears throat> I think you guys can see it right now. Uh, we're going to be in Louisville all weekend putting on a, a fundraising event at the Louisville Slugger Museum, which if you've never been there, it is fantastic. I have a bat there. You should go check it out, man. It's, it's in there. It has a great line, a great uh, message on it. Swing hard in case you hit it. Learn that from Jay Buhner. But now, um, okay, we all grew up, I, I mean, loving you guys as you were living our lives, especially me. Who wouldn't want to be free as a kid, um, just doing whatever the hell y'all want, a group of bandits, just <laughs> just, just living a life. I mean, it's hard to really put in slang, but what have you guys been up to personally? And in you guys' personal life since, obviously, in the last 30 years. 
Wow. Well, a lot. I mean, it's been 30 years. Um, yeah. You know, we, um, after we made the movie, um, a lot of us were still doing a little bit of acting and stuff and we would see each other around in interviews and uh, auditions and stuff like that. But, um, we, a lot of us kind of lost touch with each other. I, I went to college and, um, then moved back to LA after that. And, um, uh, I know Shane's uh, got a, a pizza place that he's running. Grant is uh, he's been kind of I think he was doing a lot of stuff sort of uh, behind the scenes. He got into like some agency stuff and then got into the music industry. And um, we all kind of just like went our separate ways and we're living our lives. And then uh, 10 years ago for the 20th anniversary, um, we all got brought back together um, on the Sandlot, actually. And then from there, it's just been kind of nonstop like for the last 10 years we've been doing a lot of conventions and sports trade shows and all kinds of like cool interviews and stuff like this together and so we get to see each other like all the time it's amazing I'm still acting um uh, but yeah like we're all just kind of living our lives and going around making people happy with the sandlot we're trying you guys were kids when you guys were kids and you did this did you guys were you got? Did you guys suck at baseball, or were you awesome at baseball? And <laughs> you got this, and you were like, "Yeah, let's do it." Uh, when we got cast, we all went to like a two-week baseball training camp kind of thing, and we kind of got okay. Benny, uh, Mike Vitar was extremely good, obviously the best one of all of us. But we all kind of took a uh, a training camp and uh, got good enough to look like we knew what we were doing. And then we started filming. And at that point, we were just unruly kids on set filming a, a baseball movie, having fun. Uh, at one point, we don't even know if we cared if we looked good playing baseball. We were just having fun. It was awesome. I think that was the whole point, right? Is that we weren't out there to keep score or do anything like that. It was just the, the perfect time in, in life, you know, especially back then. And I think that's one of the things that made the film so special, too, is that it came out in the 90s, which was also such a very special period of time uh, to be growing up. So, you know, playing baseball was something that kept us all together out there. But really, the whole spirit of things was the camaraderie that we all had together. And that's still happening now. You know, we get together a handful of times a year, uh, and it's almost like we get to go back to being our 12-year-old selves uh, all over again. <laughs> I think some of our fans that are either watching now or will catch it later on demand are probably like, wait, so for the past 30 years, you guys didn't just hit the sand lot and play ball every day? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You're breaking me my uh, open into question. In a perfect world, we would have done that. Yeah, we were out at dinner one night years ago in D.C. I think it was around the uh, All-Star Game uh, for the 25th, and a table noticed that we were all together, and somebody came up and said, you know, Ever since we saw that film when we were kids, we just wanted to believe that you guys were still hanging out and still playing ball and still being friends. So the fact that they got to see us all sitting down having dinner uh, kind of cemented that hope <laughs> that uh, we're all still, doing, uh, all still doing the thing together. A little wiffle ball or something at some point. These guys would love to see it. We'll broadcast it. But, uh, hey, Victor, I want to ask you, for example, you guys were talking about, hey, you went to training camp. It was just fun to be really part of a team within a movie, which is cool. Did you guys realize what you were building, like this cultural phenomenon, really, at the time that just captured the entire planet, grew the game of baseball, is still talked about as maybe the best baseball movie for me? It is easy when we get asked, and that's one of the top questions that players get asked, broadcasters, etc. So did you know what you were doing, or are you guys just like messing around as kids and, and doing a movie? Uh, you know, I mean, I think – in a lot of ways, making a movie was kind of secondary to what we were doing. We were just out there, um, like Shane said, just kind of hanging out and having fun. And um, we just happened to be making a movie around it. And um, I mean, it was great. It was like being in a summer camp um, that just happened to be filmed the whole time. So we really didn't have a sense of what it was going to be. I mean, I think we all thought it was going to be a good movie. The script was really great. Um, it was really fun. It was a good cast, but you know, I mean, you're just happy to be making something that gets put out and, and really, I mean, there was a time that we weren't sure for the first few weeks 
if the movie was ever even going to see the light of day. Um, I know that when they first started filming, um, they were watching the studio was keeping a really close eye on things and they were watching the dailies. They were watching the film every single day um, just to make sure that something was being made that was going to be releasable as a film. So um, yeah, for the first few weeks there, we didn't even know if the movie was ever going to come out. Hey, Shane, I want to ask you also, how was it, and you guys all chime in, how was it working with a legend, James Earl Jones? I mean, obviously, just a god. You guys, again, you were kids doing it, but seeing it now and seeing the movie later, like, you were in the, just in the room with, with the Hall of Famer. How was, how was that? No, uh, James Earl Jones is incredible. I remember, I think we all got to meet him in the same way, but I'll, I'll just tell my, my piece. We I got to walk in, and he was eating soup or cereal or something and i just remember i being nervous to meet him because of obvious reasons darth vader all that stuff and uh he just looked up and said hello and the way his voice is so powerful it just shook the trailer it just you were immediately like oh my god this guy is real this is this is how he is this is legit and that was awesome and then to go on set and get to work with him especially at such a young age was was incredible and that's a that's a memory i'll never forget dealing with someone of that, you know, as you put it, legend. It's, he's incredible, no doubt. Yeah, I, I want to go back just for a second too, Victor, to what you were saying. So so there was a time period you said where you guys didn't even know, like, is this going to be a movie or are we just a bunch of kids out here playing Sandlot Paul and they're recording us? Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> wild because, you know, um, David Evans, uh, who wrote and directed The Sandlot, um, also wrote radio flyer and he originally was the director on that and um after i guess the studio didn't like what they were seeing um off the bat and he was pulled off the film and they had uh dick donner who directed the lethal weapon movies and superman and goonies and a million great films um they brought him on and he ended up being the director of that film so then his next david's next movie was the sandlot and they gave him another chance to direct and they were keeping a very close eye on things. And so um, we were all very aware that like, you know, a couple of weeks in, they might just pull the plug and the Sandlot would never have been a film. So we were all just really happy that the movie got made. And of course, you know, as an actor, it's everything you dream about that like 30 years later, people are still watching it and that it still has an impact on people. You know, Kratzy, I wish that, you know how they did that, that Beatles um, long doc that where they just like recorded them making music for like yep. hours and hours. I wish they did that for Sandlot, especially this part that Victor's talking about where, you know, maybe the new guy comes in and he's like, let's fucking go. It's like, this, this is not going to be a movie if you guys don't step your shit up. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably that kind of footage out there somewhere. That, that, that's a whole nother movie right there. That's, that's a great idea. I, yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, because so much of the movie was us, you know, David was was young. He was, I think he was almost 30. I think it was about 30 when, when he was directing it. Um, and he was like, kind of became like a older brother, father figure kind of guy to us. And he would just hang around and we would be offset or in between takes and just goofing around with each other and making fun of each other and joking and stuff. And David would take note of all that and then during the the scenes when we were filming he would be like just behind the camera with a bullhorn just yelling different things out and a lot of it was stuff that we had said to each other previously that he heard and he would just like say that again hey say that joke when you did this or whatever and so a lot of it was like kind of ad lib in a way but it was like david just like feeding us things that he had heard us say before and like hey say that again so it was like really organic in that way so you guys basically like were just living everybody's dream of what this exact movie is like, and they just captured it on film. Like I was 13 when the movie came out. Like this is like you were basically playing me, except I thought it was in California and you actually shot it in Utah. So it just Utah. as as a 43 year old now, my mind is just blown. And so what what was what was the funniest moment that you wish would have made it in the movie that didn't make the movie? Because like like you know Benny the Jet, I played with a dude that looked like Benny the Jet, 
in the minor leagues. Actually, Ken Singleton, he used to be an announcer for the – got to look it up. Sometime, we'll, you know, you'd see it. Ken Singleton's son, Justin Singleton, we called him Benny the Jet because he looked like Benny the Jet. So your, your movie, we lived out. We lived out in the minor leagues. So what was one of the funniest moments that didn't make it in the movie that you guys are like, remember when – Victor did this. Remember when Shane did this? He pooped his pants as we were doing, you know, something funny. <laughs> Shane hitting ham would have been the thing I would have loved to have seen in the movie. That would have been really funny. That happened off camera. But uh, now, well, now movie. Shane has to tell the story. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Uh oh. Um, well, in in short, when you're 10, 12 year old kids and your best friends, you also play like your 10, 12 year old kids and you get on each other's nerves and, and sometimes it gets serious and, and whatever. But one we were picking on each other one day and I, I felt like he took it too far. So I gave him a good, a uh, good old slug in the face. And then I remember he, uh, he went, he went and told my mom what I did. And my mom looked at him and said, good. <laughs> it was unreal. But that, that, I wish that was on camera too, because that would have that made a great story. But there's so many things yeah. we're all just being stupid that couldn't have made it into the film. The original cut had us doing the F word for uh, a couple times. Mm -hmm. And obviously that, they chose not to put that in there. But I remember giggling like a like a like a ten year old kid getting to say the F word and you know yeah. I, think I even said it. It was it was me and Shane. We 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 said it I said it and he repeated it. And yep. uh, I think because it was said twice it would have pushed the rating of the film up. And so they cut that that out and that whole little segment got cut out there was actually you're speaking of somebody crapping their pants though um you know there's a there was a a bit that they i guess they had toyed with the idea of you know when yeah they send yaya over the fence and he's on that crane thing and they kind of like we lower him down and then he grabs the ball and then you know we raise him back up um and he comes face to face with the beast that he was so scared by that that he actually shit himself and not like, not like really like the character, you know? Um, um, and then he like walks away and never comes back. Like that was the end of the movie for Yeah. Yeah. And, um, they, they filmed it. Um, uh, but then I guess they decided against it and they, they left him in for the rest of the movie. Didn't they put like a bag, like a Ziploc bag of like food in his pants or something? Mm -hmm. So when he walked, it looked like his drawers were full. I yeah, forgot but, all about that. But, that, but that's so real. But that's yeah. so real because if you pooped your pants playing at the Sandlot, you would not, you would not come back. Right. You, would, you would not, like in real life, Jonesy's like, yeah, I did it one time and I didn't come back. So I went to the big leagues. <laughs> but you got like, that is, that's what's so authentic about the movie. And you guys, he, I think our producer has the picture of my teammate. And he was Benny the Jet. This is wow. This is Justin Singleton, wow. and I mean, he hasn't aged a bit. Like he's actually he he looks exactly the same. He's just got huge muscles yeah. now. So if you want to know what Benny the Jet looks like, look up Justin Singleton. That's exactly what the fake Benny the Jet looks like. But that is crazy. That's wild. I mean, yeah, we can hit to come out to some of these things that we're doing over the <laughs> yeah, summer. Really. We'll just put a jet he, jersey on and stand him in the back. I don't know if anybody would know that it's not Mike based on that photo. He would He would love to. I texted him this morning because you guys were coming on, and he's like, he's just outside of Philly too. So, Vic, if we're, you know, I'm just outside of Philly. So, if we're in Philly, maybe we'll all come down and we'll hang out. Definitely. Yeah, let's do it. We can have a game. Hey Grant, I want to ask you. So, so back to current life for a moment here about really two um, clubs, uh, groups, events. So, can you explain both here, the Boys of Summer Baseball Club, and also the tour that's going on right now? Um, you guys have a really cool charity organization that's picking up a lot of steam, and want to make sure everyone knows about that as well. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, you know, um, Boys of Summer Baseball Club started uh, a few years ago. Uh, me, Vic, some of the guys have been talking about how we can take a little bit more control over our faces and our property being you know, put on T-shirts and merch and stuff like that. So we've just been casually developing uh, just sort of a front-facing property for ourselves to be able to merchandise and put out the art and 
type of products that we as adults now would, would love to see. So we've got some really cool designs uh, that we're getting ready to put out um, probably in a couple weeks uh, for pre-order that's going to tie into what we're doing with the Play Forever project. Um, but as far as our day-to-day -day efforts go, the Play Forever project is really the big focus for the three of us. Uh, as I was starting to say earlier, we are a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our work is to equip young athletes and kids who are interested in the life and career in sports uh, with the opportunities that they need to essentially be able to play forever. You know, there's this uh, scene in the film where Benny busts the guts out of the baseball, and there was part of a much larger uh, plot line that got cut, but we all looked at it as an omen, and Benny says, well, unless you guys have 98 extra cents lying around, we're done playing baseball. Um, and that always got us thinking that, you know, 98 cents for a baseball in 1962, that same baseball is close to $10 today. So when you think about the opportunity uh, for kids across a variety of different socioeconomic areas, $10 is a blocker to do pretty much anything, let alone play or be involved in sports. And the data really shows that kids who participate in youth sports, uh, either on the field or off the field, uh, test better in school, have a better chance of going to college, have a better chance of uh, earning higher incomes. And the fact that this film uh, has been able to stay alive for 30 years, we thought, well, why don't we spend the next 30 years talking about what we can do uh, for communities um, based on the love that people have for this film. So wherever we can be the most effective, uh, we want to be. So all that's to say, uh, we're launching um, our first big national fundraising initiative. Uh, this is actually the first time we're publicly um, talking about it as well, but we're calling it 30 for the 30th. And in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the film, we are looking to positively impact 30 communities uh, through a combination of equipment donations, educational programs, food programs, uh, gender inequity, uh, programs. If we can write some scholarships and grants for some travel ball, uh, we're looking to do that as well. So it's going to be a big, big, big mission and effort for us this year. We're kicking it off Fourth of July weekend in Louisville. Uh, we've got a fundraiser at the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory where we're going to be doing a Q&A and a and meet and greet and talking about some of our favorite moments from the film. Uh, July 2nd uh, will be hosted by the Louisville Bats. Uh, Triple A team there play at Louisville Slugger Field. We're going to have a suite that they're giving to us, and we're going to be offering uh, suite upgrades. Come hang out, watch a handful of the game uh, with us, talk baseball, talk the movie, and then there'll be a free screening of the film and a little VIP experience down on the uh, waterfront park on July 3rd with some fireworks. And then we'll be all over the country. Uh, we're working with a handful of teams. We're working with some really great companies like Roosevelt's and Academy Sports uh, and Outdoors. And um, we're really excited to be able to make this a a full focus. Um, so being able to come on the show and talk about it a little bit really means uh, means a ton to us. And we're really looking forward to making an impact wherever we can. I think you're on mute, Jonesy. <laughs> Sorry. You go, um, I want to ask, I mean, I don't, you guys aren't, don't publicly share this, but I don't know if you had family, kids, nephew, nieces, have you been able to share this great journey uh, with them over the past 30 years? Yeah, I, I could speak for myself and then turn it over to the other guys. But, you know, I, I don't have kids. Uh, my wife and I, it's been by design. And for me, um, Play Forever Project is really my way of being able to have the broadest impact to as many kids uh, as possible. So I've got nieces and nephews who uh, I love so very, very, very much. And they've been a lot of the inspiration, at least for me on this. They're all involved in, in sports. Uh, my nieces do gymnastics and lacrosse and basketball and my nephew is playing baseball already and it's been a real inspiration um from from my side of things and naturally they they love the film and whenever we can get them together with the, the cast and appearances and stuff uh, they always love it yeah, that's yeah awesome. between family friends and just fans across america like the film's always always a central talking point wherever we go and that's a really cool way to to share something special with, of course, family and friends, but with strangers all across America. When we go do a show, sometimes we get kids of all ages and, and men in their 70s or 60s that come up to us and they have that story about what the film means to them. And that is, is extremely powerful. So the, the film has given 
it's part of our lives every day and it's given us so much. And that's kind of why we wanted to, to work so hard to kind of give back because uh, you know, the future matters more than we do right now. So if we can help, then then let's do it. You know, Jonesy, I know you had one more and then I've got one more finisher. Go for it. Hey Shane, I got an inner fat guy. Is the pizzeria good? Well, we've been there for 13 oh, years this August. So <laughs> now. Uh, and uh, it's been very good to me. And, uh, you know, uh, the community has been, and beyond the community, has been extremely supportive, uh, whether they uh, want to admit it or not, with how much pizza they eat. So uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take their word for it because uh, of the success I've had. And, yeah, it's, it's pretty damn good. That's well, I can tell you, I was I was just there. Uh, I was just there like maybe two months ago. Right. Vi- visiting Shane and I stopped in there and I, I had the pizza and I also tried the cheesesteak and both were really legit, especially as a Philly guy. I can tell you the cheesesteak was legit. Oh, thanks. Jonesy will put it on his tour. He travels everywhere, way more than all of us. He's in freaking Europe right now. Um, so so let's let's finish. Yeah, he lives in Barcelona. Fun fact. So uh, let's finish with this. Just one of you, maybe raise your hand or point to the other. Who was the most like their actual character in the movie of you three? Like who actually resembled your character in real life the most? Wow. A Victor, maybe. I, I, I mean, maybe me being the younger brother, I used to look up to Victor. And of course, I still do in, in, in certain ways. But he, he was always so cool. And his character was just kind of cool. And uh, that was kind of a reflection of him. So uh, I'm going to say Vic, but uh, I don't know. So Vic is Timmy? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was actually going to say Shane because as like a little brother, you know, he was kind of like, you know, he was a couple years younger than all of us. Um, and so he was sort of like everybody's little brother on set, you know, and he was like, the you know the little brother that was there and he was like a couple years younger you know and he but he was like we still like part of the crew um but like you could tell you know he was like he looked up to to all of us um so i kind of felt like he was he was all of our repeat thanks that is cool i like that awesome (laughs) well hey guys we loved having you on what are you saying jones he's like the sultan of swat he's like the sultan of swat (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> guys this was awesome it was really great to have you we'll, we'll follow your journey this summer and obviously let us know if we can help anything and we'll blast it out to everyone awesome thank, thank you so, so much, much for having us on sounds, sounds good awesome. man yeah, appreciate we'll grab a, it. a great steak when I'm in philly yeah let's go let's go all right cheers guys <laughs> appreciate you three from the mem- from the cast of sandlot with us uh on the show there grant victor and Shane, that was awesome. Um, and, and it does feel like a team, right? It feels like the vibe I get from those guys is one of you guys, you know, hanging out with one of your former teammates, right? You've got stories, you've got the bond, the whole deal. It's real. It's not just like, you know, I'm this A-list actor and I just show up and I have 80 people in my entourage and I, I leave the trailer, do my lines and go back. They're like, no, we we're, were playing baseball. We didn't know if the movie was going to be made. Like, there was some drama. We were 10. We got to say fuck, but it got taken out. Like, that's <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's the high that school really baseball cool. team. That's your high school baseball team. Yeah. You go back to your city, you know, and just get around the guys. You, you know, it's hard to get around 15, 20 guys. But when you get around three or four guys, and I know now with Facebook, you know, we have the technology to still be in those groups. You know, it's like you never lost touch. Obviously, we all have different lives and go our separate ways and do different things. But, you know, when we get back together, we still have those laughs and bring back all these memories. And, you know, that's just that, that's the cool part about making history with somebody, especially good history. Is you can always laugh about it. OK, so a lawyer man is going to join us soon on FT Live. And man, my chain is it's just freaking driving me nuts. Today. Uh, let's go in the weeds. <laughs> Sorry, fun fact. In the weeds. I'm taking this thing off. That ain't no damn chain. This is the chain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't get that, that that big league deal yet. Still hey, waiting for it. Baseball was Betty Betty Goo. <laughs> Betty Betty Goo for me. <laughs> so, so I got two here left on, on In the Weeds. Let's start with 
our one of our favorite topics, the commissioner of baseball, Rob Manfred. This was interesting. I, I liked hearing the candid response that he gave to Time Magazine. I, I read some of what he talked about and then read, of course, all of Evan Drellick's article. And here's the tweet from Evan. Manfred told Time that if he could do it over again, he might not have offered the Astros immunity in the cheating scandal. So four years later, and he's showing some regrets for how he handled it with the player's side, right? Because you had Jeff Lunau suspended, the GM, the manager, A.J. Hinch, uh, the bench coach, Alex Cora, and you had a fine for $5 million bucks, whatever. Every owner's rich. That means nothing. Four lost draft picks. And the other thing that I will mention before I throw it to Kratzy, because you've obviously got some, some Houston in you, uh, the MLBPA obviously would have challenged anything that they threw at the players and said, this is unprecedented. We don't have this. So for me, I think the lawyer in Manfred, because that's he's lawyer first, probably said, I'm not winning this case if I just start suspending dudes and I don't know how to actually go about this. So I'm going to leave them, let them tell me anything that they can and then suspend the like adults in the room as in like management. I think I, I love his candidness. I love the fact that he's being accountable. What? Three years after the ruling came four. out, four years after the ruling came out, probably too late, but I, I can't just always be the cynic when it comes to, Manfred, but like you look at you look at the suspensions and stuff and talking to some of the people that got suspended that I was close to, like they they almost felt like they had to say, yes, I you know I did things wrong. Like that's that was the way that it had to be handled. But the players, they're just they look like they're just skating down the pond, like never, nothing ever happened. It was totally fine. Eh, a few people booed me, but it's fine. We got earplugs. We don't need to worry about that. I think it's a, I think it's a, at the beginning when everything was coming out, it was a cop out by, because Evan Drellick kind of hits on it in his, in his article. And Evan, you know, couldn't be closer to this, topic than anybody else you know all that he's written about it and he said he was like he was like well if that's the case then you need to give immunity in any kind of investigation like he was like ah well you know we didn't know if we'd really get all the information that's the investigation part of it and I think the investigation part when I got put not to the screws but I had accused the Rockies of using a Theragun on a metal bench and it came out in a podcast. A day later, somebody from the MLB investigation committee called me and she was like, well, do you have any information that you want to discuss with me? I was like, well, you already heard everything that I said and everything that I said was true. And she was like, okay, well, you know, do you have somebody that you can corroborate the story with? And I was like, no, they're still playing. Like, I'm not going to sit here. And she's like, oh, it's totally fine. Don't, don't worry about that. I understand. But would there still be anybody else that you would like to say also knew this? And I was like, yes, but they're still in the game and I'm not going to give anybody up like that. And she was like, okay, no problem. And that was the end of the investigation. But MLB, <laughs> like it was like, you didn't really investigate anything. MLB was told, and I think Evan brings it out in his book, from other teams during 2017, hey, something's going on here. Where were they on that? Where were they? Like, yes, they could. They might get one. They might get somebody's, you know, saying, hey, I think somebody's doing something shady. Your job is to look it up. Your job is to make sure that the game's integrity is intact. If multiple teams made complaints against a single team, investigate it. And they didn't. And then they had found these scapegoats and they shouldn't have given the immunity to the players. And this, to me, proves, I think, sometimes they're also, like, too overwhelmed. Like, there needs to be game business. Do you know what I'm saying, Kratzy? One dude is overseeing everything. We've talked about this before. Game, as in rules, issues on the field, calls that teams are cheating, business. I got to figure out our new TV deal. I'm battling with the players about contracts. Like, that's a lot, right? Like, 
So I know there's people within the offices that that work in both spots, but I'm saying like head honchos, separate sides, you know? And hey, Jonesy, I mean, you played during that time period, obviously. Mm-hmm. We're, I'm sure you were pissed. And, and what were your thoughts at the time when you heard about that? Because so 19, you were, where were you? Were you D-backs? No, yeah, 19, I was in D-backs. Um, I mean, I think the everybody has the advantage of technology and all that. I just think that people get just mad that, you know, I guess they went further with it. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's always like, you know, you want to make sure that you said the lawyer. Lampert's a lawyer, first and foremost. He's going to make sure that he makes the right verbiage, says the right verbiage. Um, it wasn't the right verbiage to say, uh, you know, the, that the championship was just uh, was it, some aluminum, something. It wasn't, it wasn't much. It's just, it's just, I don't know, it's just a sticky subject because it, it's, it's good that he admitted it, that he, you know, could have did this. Again, the Players Association would have fought him to the, the death of it. Um I don't know. It's just, it's, I just think that who cares anymore? <laughs> I don't even know why they're still interviewing. Like there's so much more to talk about again. And it's going to be something like that again in sports. It's just how it works. There's always going to be some new advantage now with the sticky stuff. It's just, we're still talking about something that's all time. Obviously time is one of the you know magazines that focuses on historical events and it is, but in the game, there's so much more going on. And who cares anymore? Honestly, like as a baseball fan, only time I ever care is when the Astros are playing the Yankees. That's the only time I, I think I ever care. Well, you need the game needs to be fair, though. That's the thing, right? For fans to to buy into it, right? Integrity is important, and of course for the players. I mean, at the time, players were freaking out, and some of them said that they should have punished Astros players. So, like, were you one of those when when you heard about it at the time? Yeah. Were you like, damn? I wish those guys got in some trouble because they took this thing too far. Or like, eh, there's so many variations of this bullshit going on right now with with the Apple Watch and what the Yanks were doing and Kratzy's mm-hmm. on the Rockies with their Theragun. They're getting massages and getting pitches thrown. Like, wh- what were your thoughts back then when you heard about it? Well, with the Rockies, I'm not concerned about that because so, no, they wouldn't win any damn thing. Um, <laughs> it didn't matter. Give all the pitches to them. Um, yeah, but I mean, you could. You, like, as a player, I was upset, like, and you can, to find, to suspend a player like that, again, is unprecedented, but it, it would have set precedent because the incident set precedent. Um, as a player, as a current player at the time, I was frustrated with them. Um, I knew that everybody had the technology and can do that. Again, they were doing it at pitch. I mean, I gave signs at second base all the damn time because I knew how to decipher the three or five different counts and the sequences that were given if there was a latin and an american that was pretty easy go on the time after two um <laughs> I, I learned those things Kratz, you know i'm right i learned yeah. those things but to do it the way they did it i think you know players could i think players could have been uh could have been punished but again it sets a it's such a such a major precedent um i just think that it, it personally has tarnished a lot of those individuals uh, that were bigger names in it, you know, Springer, Altuve, Correa, who are the biggest names um, uh, of that of that that team right at that point. Verlander was a pitcher at the time, just got over there, so I don't think he gets any. But there's some guys that I just think it's going to always be about them and around and over their head. Correa, anytime he goes to New York, it's always going to be something. But, ah, I mean, if it didn't happen then, I don't care anymore. I mean, it's, they got a whole new team. There were born players at, at 18 that had nothing to do with it. So, or, and I'm sorry, at 19. So it's just like, it, it's over and done with. But I mean, it's just, just, I think there's better storylines in today's era. No, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people are definitely still salty about it, you know, yeah. and they probably always will be. I don't really care that much anymore because it's been enough time, but, right? Okay, I but just, do that. If the yeah. fans really know what each team was really doing, They'd all be salty at the next ones, okay? Fans only know about this much of what's really, really going on in, the, in that dugout, in the clubhouse. Again, you can see the iPads. You don't know what's going on between them and in the, up in that tunnel, man. There's so much more dynamic than what was what is shown to you. It's more dynamic than what was what is shown to you in the dugout. So if you really, really got to know everything that's going on in there, you'd hate everybody. Because it was Wild West. Exactly. It wasn't being the, the, name of the, the name of the game is to win. 
and it's to win a championship. That's the name of it. And hey, at the end of the day, you you gonna you gonna pull somebody's hair, or pull somebody's uh, pants down to get ahead of them. I don't give a damn who you saying. If you say no, I'm not. I'm gonna work hard and do this. You got the opportunity to do something, and it's right there. You're probably gonna do it. Human nature. Yep. Well, they hey, they implemented technology, so you can't be mad about that. You can't be mad about somebody manipulating technology if. The whole grand scheme of this was to make sure that everybody can watch it on his phone. Make sure that you, I'm, I'm on the, in the airport, like, oh, yeah, I can see the game. So if you're going to implement technology, you're going to have to implement the people that know how to manipulate the living hell out of it. Yeah, first sign. First sign. Shake, first sign. Two. <laughs> after two. <laughs> Always after two. Latin pitchers <laughs> is the first thing they would come out and go, uh, first sign after two. I'm like, what? No, like, this is not, like, he's looking. Like, he is looking <laughs> at my signs. You can't go, and my favorite was when catchers would be out there like this and be like. <laughs> and you're like, well, it's either fastball or slider, so then we'll <laughs> wait for the next one, and they're like. <laughs> or, or they buzz through all of them, and they're like. Oh, last sign. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. Got it. <laughs> right. You can get the tell on the way that the catcher is giving signs, right? Oh, easy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. At the lower levels, for sure. You get higher levels, obviously. It shouldn't uh, be like that. More language language. Language. But it happens, especially when, you, especially when you face a catcher who's a really good hitter because he's worried about his hitting. And those, those signs, they get really, they get really, like, you can see it. Like, it's like, you know, you're supposed to give the sign super, you know, everything looks exactly the same and you have no idea. And there's even stuff you can pick up during that stuff. If you watch the guy enough, probably not in one at bat when you're sitting out there, but you got to be able to switch it up. Hey, so one more for in the weeds, Hal Steinbrenner spoke Yankees owner yesterday. And I love when owners come out and have conversations. I mean, it's how's great. How's great for being open and you want the access. Of course, Steve Cohen's awesome. He'll, I mean, he'll do interviews. He'll, he'll tweet. He'll tweet uh, he pointed him. out John Middleton yesterday, but so let's get into what Hal talked about for a bit. He was on the Michael K show. And the, the big thing that he's getting crushed for right now after on the aftermath of what he talked about was that he basically said he, he's confused why Yanks fans are upset with their performance because it's only three weeks into June and it's a long season. And we'll, we'll get we'll get into it later. We'll, we'll come back to it because we got our next guest on FT Live. First time on the show, Aloy Menez joining us right now from the Chicago White Sox. Aloy, how you doing, man? How's life out there? It's good. Uh, nice and warm right now. So it's good. Where are you at? Chicago. In Chicago, okay. So how's this series been going with the uh, with the Texas Rangers? There's been a lot of attention on it because we're all – I'll just get right into it. We're all really confused about how you're able to slide into home plate without a catcher blocking you and getting called for interference. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I think that was – Good that they call save because it wasn't uh, cover the home plate. But I think Elvis uh, his end on the home plate, and uh, that was good. Yeah, it worked out for them, Jonesy. Yeah, um, Eloy, good to see you, Bobby. I'm glad, I'm glad you're back and healthy. Glad you're back on the field. You're one of the best players in the game. Um, what has Pedro Grifo meant to? the organization, not just the Latin players, obviously being a Cuban, he's tremendous. Um, he was my farm director. I had him when I was a young pup coming up with the Mariners. So what has he meant to as being a new manager? Uh, oh, he's gone. Yeah. I, I know he what gone. that is. I can tell he you gone. what that is. He didn't want that to answer that question. My phone's <laughs> blowing up. And when it does, it knocks you out. So AJ was calling him like, or Rick Hahn. Like, hey man, they gonna answer some tough questions about me. Don't answer he He'll come right back. The old do not disturb back. sign. <laughs> we got to get that nice, like, phone placement on the table. So he's not rocking with us, too. But big smile for Aloy. He said weather's Always. good out there for Chicago. I mean, 
that's one of the things, and, and we can get into it. You playing out there, Jonesy, first month or two, not ideal at times, super was, cold. Last really, month or two, not ideal at times, can get cold and, and windy out, not as bad, Kratzy. October, October. Yeah, gets, October, I mean, right. You, you can have some days, but that's that, that was honestly my first question I was going to ask him, so I can't wait till he gets back on. I want it like the weather in Chicago, like it's – it's real, but the summer, the summer's real too. I uh, love it. Yeah, no, the summers in Chicago are among the best on the planet. Um, you've got a vibe there for a few months, but you got to weather the storm through the beginning. Let's bring in this the sunshine again in Chicago. Eloy Jimenez is back. Tell everyone stop calling you for like fifteen minutes. <laughs> Eloy, you're, you're you're a popular man. Kratz, go ahead, ask him about the weather for a sec. Eloy, ¿de cuándo firmaste, firmaste con Chicago? Sab, sab, ¿Sabías que has, hacías frío? Is it, did you know when you signed with Chicago that it was so cold up there? Or were you, would you have signed with somebody else? Uh, I, I don't <laughs> Like, I traveled here before uh, when I was younger uh, with the Dominican team. But it, it was nice, like, right now. But... If I like sped that it's gonna be this cold, Jesus, I will think about it. But uh, I like the city and just <laughs> like the weather sometimes. But this is good city, and um, I like the people here around here. Tu sabe. <laughs> Jonesy, go back. We lost oh, yeah. you on yours. Yeah, before I was cut off, or you was cut off because you got spotty Wi Fi. Yankees, y'all, y'all like the Yankees don't pay for your Wi Fi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, what does Pedro Grifo mean to you guys? He was my farm director. Kratz, he's had some time with him. Uh, with the Royals. What what is what is uh, Pedro Grifo meant to the organization? Aside from the wins and losses, what what is he meant for uh, for the for the team and for the organization? You know, uh, he's been uh, he's been doing his job. You know, um, it's good to have someone who speaks Spanish and English. Uh, because uh, pretty much most of the time you have guys that not speak English. And um, that's really good for us um, that we got a uh, staff that speaks Spanish, you know. Uh, so he's mean uh, good things to the organization. He, he brings so much ideas and... Uh, I know this is going to get better uh, at some point. Uh, we're working hard every single day. Um, and he's doing his job, so it's good. ¿Por qué necesito persona con uh, uh, español y inglés? What, is that, what does that mean to you? Does it make you feel more well, comfortable, somebody that speaks Spanish and English? Uh, for me, I, like, I, I don't have any problem, you know, because I speak English, but with other guys like uh, Luis Robert. He speaks English a little bit, but he feels way more comfortable speaking Spanish. So it's good for him to have uh, that kind of manager or staff that can speak both. Or for other guys like uh, Jose Rodriguez. He, he come up uh, two days ago and he never speak like that fluent English, you know, and uh, so for us it's good. And sometimes I like to speak Spanish because that's my first uh, language. Sometimes me gusta hablar español. Sometimes really? I like to speak Spanish too. Like, oh, but does yeah. that does that make you a better player? Does that make like like think back when you know? Maybe your English, you weren't as confident with your English. Or think, put yourself in those guys' shoes. Does that make Luis Robert, like Pedro Grafal said the other day, he's the best center fielder in the game. Does that make him a better center fielder? Or does that just make him more comfortable as a person, which makes him more, a better center fielder? I, I think more comfortable as a person. But when, when you are more comfortable as a person, that's uh, made you a better player because you have more confidence in everything you do. Hey. Aloy, uh, I want to ask you about your ball club because, like you said, yeah, things are going to get better. You're five and a half games out of first place in the American League Central. Wait, whoa. 
you're five and a half games out of first place in the AL Central. We're not even halfway through the season. So uh, this is a little bit of a twist on a question that players get often in September. They'll be asked, hey, are you scoreboard watching? Are you looking at the standings? And I know it's very early, but I actually think it's a positive for your team to look at the standings because the record is not great, right? You wouldn't be like, oh, this is the record that I want. But five and a half games out of first place is the same as the defending champion Houston Astros in the American League West. They're five and a half games back of the Texas Rangers. So do you guys look at that as a positive where you'll be like, hey, guys, I know it's been shitty at times for us and we're not performing as well as we want to, but we're a seven game win streak away from being super relevant. Yeah, you know, uh, like you say, we we know we're playing the baseball that we want, but uh, we are there. Uh, we have uh, 10, 10 games l- lose a uh, streak, and then uh, we came back and played well. Uh, and it's been up and down, but uh, as soon as we uh, – Starting get get those wins, you know. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be like in first place, or maybe we we're gonna be tying for the white card, you know. But uh, it's, it's still a lot of games, uh, and we we've been working really hard. So for us to have. Uh, know the result that we want, but still fighting for the for the spot in the playoffs. That's good. Hey right, Eloy, move your damn hand out the out the camera, man. Um, <laughs> I wanna, <laughs> I wanna <laughs> no vato, man. <laughs> uh, I wanna ask. Obviously, the biggest thing in, in the White Sox fans want to know is about your health. Um, how are you feeling now, and what are you doing to maintain maintain staying on the field? When you play, you're an absolute beast. When you know, when you don't play, you're like everyone else. You're a spectator. So, what are you doing to main, to, to stay on the field? Again, running into walls, playing the game, sliding into bases, things and things happen. But what are you doing to prevent the random occurrence of a hamstring or an oblique? Well. Uh... With all this past year, um, I learned uh, more how, how I need to prepare my body. Uh, and that's what I try to do, you know. Um, every time, every day, um, I work really hard. Uh, sometimes things happen uh, that you can't control. Sure. Uh, and... That's what I can say right now because I've been put the effort. I've been working every single day, and uh, uh, like what I say, if it happened, it happened for a reason. So every time that I that I got hurt, uh, I come back and I try to come back with like learning something, you know, and uh, why did it happen? What? why I need to do better. And that's what I learned. And I try to do and improve what I learn in every single day. Do you love to learn? Do you like to learn? Because I heard your I heard your English before and it wasn't it wasn't this good. Did you want to learn English? Yeah. Like like I say every single day you learn something new. Uh so uh that's what I try to do. Um, because uh, life is about to learn every single time, every single day you learn something new. Well, I want to learn this then. When you were growing up, when we vive, vive in Santo Domingo, que favorito, because yo soy, yo soy favorito like equipo in la liga, because yo soy aguilucho, malo mía, malo mía. No, you got to translate. What was your favorite team in the Dominican when you were growing up? Uh... I don't have a special, special, like, oh, this is my favorite. Uh, but when I was a kid, if Licey lost, I root for the Escogido. If Escogido lost, I root for the Licey because they 
they from the capital. So and I'm from the capital. So that's that's pretty much my two favorite teams uh, in in the Dominican when I was a kid. But when I come to the uh, be a professional player, I don't have any any favorite. My favorite was the Gigantes, and then now Escogido is my favorite. Okay, está bien. Mm. Hey, Papi, Papi, want to know, how did you learn English so quickly, though? Because I remember speaking to you years ago and just getting it, you started social media, you're just getting it, but you speak it really, really well. And, like, the transition, you know, when you go all over places, Miami's and all, it's like you understand everybody, especially it's kind of like a gift and a curse when you can understand everybody. But, you know, how long did it really take you to understand English and our expressions, but – Spanish, especially you Latins and baseball, y'all express yourselves just like we do in English, okay? La madre. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in 2014, when I came uh, for the first time to play with the Cubs, uh, I started to uh, ask myself if I want a translator or I want to learn English. Because uh, I don't like to wait on people to translate me or when I can put the effort and, uh, and learn, you know. So I started learning from 14 uh, to 16. And then I started to speak uh, better English. Uh, in 2019, 2018, yeah. And every day I learn more, more and more and more. Quién es líder? Líder? Is a líder? Uh, ¿Cómo se dice líder? In English? Uh, in, in español, líder? Líder. Líder in, in the clubhouse. Quién? We have a lot of leaders over there, so it's Quien? not just one. It's not one player. It's a lot of players, you know. Different guys? Yeah, different Two? guys. Uh, or you relax, you say, relax, you're chilling, you're mindful. Hey, I, I don't want to say me because I don't like to say that. I don't like. But uh, I don't know what the other guys think. So that's why I don't say that I'm a leader in the clubhouse, but uh, I think I help my teammates sometimes, and that's what leaders do. Has, has there been... Uh, he's uh, he's gone. Get that. No, you're, no, you're in the dark. This kid's turning uh, the lights go. off. He's back. Um, have, has there been a, like, just a big void since, you know, Abreu's gone? I mean, big Latin... I mean, big Cuban guy who's just, you know, it's been, it's been, a, it's been, he's been you guys' leader. Really, he's been the leader. If you want to talk about the leader, he's been the leader. And now he's been gone. Has there been a void that, uh, since he's been there, like you're missing your brother? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, he was the big guy here. Uh, he was such a good teammate. Uh, he tried to play every single day, and uh, that's pretty much motivated you to do the same. Uh, so for us, uh, well, especially for me, it was surprising the, that he left. But uh, that is this is business. Uh, besides the baseball, this is business. So uh, it surprised me and not surprised me at the same time. ¿Qué haces en tus, en tus días libres? What do you do on your day off? What do you do on your days off when you're not, when you don't have to go to the field? Well, uh, I like to play video games. I like to uh, be chill with my daughters and, uh, and family. ¿Qué juegos? What games? Uh, 2K and uh, Warzone. 2K, K. Uh -huh. 2K NBA or? NBA, 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 NBA. NBA. 
didn't you want to play basketball? Some of our fans in the chat asking, like AJ said, Aloy originally wanted to play basketball and ask him about his first at bat as a kid. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not going to lie. Yes. Uh, yes. This uh, basketball was and still my favorite sport. Uh, if I had the opportunity to play basketball instead of baseball, well, uh, yes. But uh, in Dominican basketball, it's no, it's not as big as baseball. So um, that's why I'm playing baseball. And um, yeah, my first at bat. Uh, it was he by pitching my head, and then uh, I say I quit. I don't want to play this game. I don't like this <laughs> game. And then my dad uh, asked me, "Hey, why you not uh, like a month later, a month and a half later?" He he asked me, "Hey, why you not try it and see what happened again?" And I hit a home run, and signed that day, I started like it uh, a little bit more and more and more, and now I'm here. So baseball's <laughs> facile. Baseball's facile for you. Uh, it's not that easy. <laughs> I asked but, if it was easy. But yeah, it's good. <laughs> can you beat? Can you beat everybody in the ML? Would you be the best basketball player from from the league? Well. Uh, I'm not going to say that because I have a long time that I don't play basketball. My my dad don't let me, since 14 years old, play basketball. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to say that. But if I but, practice, yeah, I I can. Who do you think? Who do you think could could maybe maybe beat you in basketball? Do you know of anybody? Like, have you played with any teammates that were good? And you're like, ooh, you're, uh, you're kind of good. I, I hear I – hear, Anderson was good, but I never watched him play. Uh, I hear our, our number one prospect, uh, Montgomery, he, he is a good player. So that's the only two that I hear. They, they really – oh, and uh, Middleton, uh, he played too. Oh, the reliever? The pitcher. Yeah, the yeah. reliever, yeah. Matt Manning probably good, 6'6". Six, six. His dad played in the NBA. Um, dude on the Tigers. Who do you, hey, Aloy, who do you want to dunk on? If you could dunk on one <laughs> player in the league, who would you dunk on? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, How about on your team? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I don't have anybody on. in my mind right now, so I don't know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't like to dunk on Tim Anderson just one time? Like, just. Like, dude, <laughs> you, you can't handle this game. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yes. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Lloyd, with only being five and a half back out, um, and not everybody knows you guys have not played your best baseball yet, and only being five and a half out, going forward, what can and will make the White Sox a better team? Uh, or who? Because you can't just trade that line coming. True. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the thing with us is uh, the health. You know, um, when when we are together, uh, we play such a good baseball. Uh, but when we got me out, or TA out, or Monkey out, Moncara out, or that's that's made us uh, like I don't say the the guys that we have right now they you know try to do their best but when you have your whole lineup it's it's better and you feel that you can do it but when when I'm out or when Monkey out or when Ta out or when Roberts is out. Uh, the line is starting like go up and down, and uh, and like like I say, I don't want to disrespect my teammates. It's just uh, our help. Yeah, gotta keep you guys on the field. All right, let's finish with this because I had fun with uh, Matt Olson from the Braves the other day. I was on the show, and I said, "What's something that fans say to you that 
you think's funny or silly or whatever, right? So I'll ask it to you, like, what will make you smile if you have an interaction with a fan or you see something on social media? And what will make you laugh or frown or be like, they're a troll? Because Matt Olson was like, I love when fans will say, hey, um, I have some suggestions for your two-strike approach. I think you should shorten up your swing. And he's like, I'm good, dude. Okay, I'm, I'm good. I got it. I, I know what I'm doing. I got big league coaches. I appreciate you. Just just enjoy the party. Uh, you know what is funny? Uh, <laughs> when, they, when we play uh, away and they start to say – uh, bad words. I really, <laughs> I really enjoy when they say it. Sometimes because they just wanna get you attention, and uh, I just look bad, and they starting ah, screaming at me and say <laughs> you trash and all that, and uh, I started like go back and forth, and I, I really like that. Um, that is that is. Uh, what I really uh, <laughs> find that is funny about the game because they say that sometimes they mean it, but pretty much, pretty much uh, every time they just like uh, forget your attention. So um, I think that is funny. Yeah, they just yell curse words. They don't even they don't even know what they're saying. They're just trying to get you to look at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These guys yeah. have been there. Like oh, sure. that is yeah. that is uh <laughs> that is funny because uh when we play in New in New York the other day, that crowd is crazy. They they <laughs> I don't know I don't know what they eat, what they <laughs> they doing, but they have so much energy that whole nine innings cursing and try to get your attention like that is crazy mm -hmm. and to me that's i respect that like i really respect that that they have energy if they losing or they winning they are there to get your attention like <laughs> that is crazy to me and you have to egg them on too though you're like they just sitting in just for all nine innings you got to be like okay Say something bad, and Toronto always be like, "Yeah, go Leafs." <laughs> <laughs> always got to say something to somebody to be like, "Oh yeah, well how's how's that team doing this year?" Or go back and sleep in your mom's basement, man. Like something, <laughs> something you got to respond with something. Yeah. Obviously, you know, sit there cuss at them. You can't cuss back at them, but sitting there's something that can maybe get the fans around them laughing and get them embarrassed. Just try and get them back. Yeah, that that's that's really a good one. Like. Uh, in, in New York, uh, it was a guy who was cursing a lot, and uh, <laughs> I just, I just tell him, "Hey, why you not ask your mom if she likes me real?" <laughs> and, and everybody started, and everybody you know what he started called you. laughing. Everybody started laughing, and he just like, <laughs> and I say, "Yes, got him." <laughs> he's like bro, like they can't believe you spoke back that's what yeah, happens most of the time like, they said, that's, that's what I really like like when I spoke back and they like oh he really pay attention to us like that's <laughs> good yeah they'll they'll throw like thousands of darts all game like please <laughs> please please notice me so, oh, yes, you're a real human being. That's why we're bringing you on the show, too. Aloy, this was awesome, man. It was great to catch up with you. We'll have you on again in a few weeks. Keep doing your thing out there. Keep climbing up through those standings. And we'll talk to you again when you're in first place in, like, three weeks. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. You got it. Appreciate you. Aloy Jimenez from the Chicago White Sox joining us. That's, that's, that might be one of my new go-tos, Kratzy. The fan interaction stuff. Especially because for this show, I'm always trying to bring things that, like, like the cookie cutter, you know, TV shows can't do. Like I want to hear, yeah, if, if a fan's getting into it with someone, there's a little cursing going on. That's that's what we're here for. I like I like how he said, yeah, your mom. What's your mom think of me? And everyone, <laughs> you know, everybody's like, 
wait, what? He said something and he just roasted you? Like, your mama <laughs> jokes need to come back. But, like, they got to be like, maybe, maybe, let's, maybe let's get it on your daddy now. Like, your mama jokes, you don't, like, mom, moms have taken it on the chin for too long. But Well, my, mine would be like, your mom let you curse like that? She yeah. here? It's like, Pedroia always, Pedroia's one was always like, you know, they would always be like, oh, you're so sure, you're so sure. And he would always go, yeah, I'm not that short when I'm standing on my wallet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Brett. You got that from Brett Boone. That's a great one. Um, some dude in Boston was like, hey, man, I was out with your mom last night. And so I was just like, well, damn, she didn't call me. That's kind of rude of her. Like, she's, in, she's in town and she didn't call me. Like, I love rude. you, mom. Meet Lo. <laughs> yeah. What's up? Like, you don't call me. I thought we have dinner. Uh, let's slap hands, baby. Ball. Oh, that's so AJ. That is so AJ. Uh, by the way, Aloy Jimenez is uh, going to be one of the regulars, so you'll see him more often on FT Live. So I'll have some fun with him. That was good stuff. First time on with Aloy. Um, so... Two things. One, we've passed 8K subs on YouTube, so thanks, everyone. Appreciate that. Um, can't wait for 8 mil. It's coming. Uh, it's long numbers. road ahead. Kratzatz, what do you got? Well, today we went – the next one up was the Yankees, 2020. Yeah, 2020. Uh, they gave us these hats for the September 11th game. That was something – Pretty special. I think they still do it every single September 11th. I'm not sure, but 2020, it was cool to be a Yankee, to be a part of it. And so it was something that, you know, another Yankees hat, you're going to start seeing a bunch of Yankees hat. We got a bunch of them, even though they only have really one, two hats that they wear with BP and the game hats. But somehow I just keep pulling out like different commemorative ones. Yeah, just like little, little alternates, little tweaks. I like it, right, based off the classic. And then uh, for tomorrow, Corbin Burns joining us, Paul Seawalt joining us, and a special guest host. I will allow her to announce it on her own socials. So stay tuned for that as well. No me, okay? First day off. I'm out, I'm retiring. Oh, good <laughs> run. <laughs> Four good months. Jonesy, I think next time we have you on, you'll be in the States, no? Yeah. I You're coming be. over? American Jones. I'll Hell be in America. Yeah. And we're going to see him at All Star too. So, yep. cheers everyone to your respective places. I'm disappearing into a forest for a few days, but I will reemerge next week, hopefully. <laughs> trolls are in forests, so just be careful with trolls. 